one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to People Add Value Experience. Today is a really rad day as I have some realtors and bodacious brokers on from Sound Choice Realty, Andrew and Tiffany Tidwell. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good and evening. Depending <laughs> on when you're listening. That's right. That's yes. right. <laughs> some, some time zone somewhere. I have some, some people I used to play rugby with that I see every once in a while from Germany tag in and i'm like oh cool some people from like overseas listen to this that's pretty so neat. It's good afternoon awesome. it's good afternoon there yeah <laughs> or yeah evening kind of and it's interesting too do you know who mr beast is yes so My kids watch mr beast all the time yeah so mr beast like learns i watch some backstory like he gets some of his stuff translated and like for like india and some of the asian markets which has like made his following gigantic so it's it's a good thing right that's some cool. other languages that's you never cool. know absolutely you never know it's universal um so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk uh, a little bit about y'all your backgrounds how you met um how and why you actually decided to get into being realtors and brokers <laughs> reality is like one of the toughest words for me i don't know why reality i don't it sounds so funny it's almost it close to reality yes like it's reality they, they literally Realty. teach you in school it's real tour real tour Oh, real tour. Yeah, it's yeah. weird. No, thank you. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So Courtney says ER different than I say ER. It sounds like she slows it down and she's like ER. Like, and I'm like <laughs> ER? Like ER. Like it's ER. this whole ER. So Southern. real tour. Real, real tour. tour. And broke. Not real uh, tea broke or real uh, tour. Uh, real tour. Real tour. Real tour. See, that's the nugget. We haven't even gotten, what, <laughs> 90 seconds in, and everyone now knows how to pronounce that's real right. tour. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. So we'll talk a little bit about the background, like I said, and then we're going to actually get into the business. Um, look at sort of where we're coming from, right? We have, we've have we had some some big changes in, in the market scene. Um, I know that y'all have sold and bought and have rental properties and do so much more. So um, it's really great to have y'all on from this respective industry. And uh, again, right, the whole genesis is adding value. So I know you have a ton of information respectively and together that we're going to be able to share. So what I'd like to do is we'll kick it off individually, right? So what we'll do is I'll just ask you individually, you know, sort of your, your background feel comfortable. If you want to go, I remember the light of the hotel room or the hospital room and like coming out and, you know, <laughs> oh, mother and like whatever. I don't care. So however far back you want to go. Um and then just sort of talking up to the point, you know, really where you met. And then together we'll talk about where you met or, or together as the story goes, right? Because I'm sure you have your own perspectives, yes. respectively. <laughs> we do. <laughs> right? And then we'll get into like, okay, what made you want to go ahead and be like, hey, I'm a realtor now, right? Real tour now. Yeah. Um, and then how you got to the broker scene. And then looking at the trends, uh, you know, again, a little bit historically, like we don't even have to go too far back, right? You know, whatever kind of milestones are appropriate just to show this wave and how we got to where we're at now. And um, any future predictions, right? Because I know that's that's sort of like anybody rolling the dice or going, hey, let's go to the roulette table because you really never know um, just what you're what you're seeing. So uh, who would like to go first? Andrew would. I would say ladies first, but if she says I have to go first, go I will. First. So. Yes. Um, I grew up in a family with uh, five brothers, so I'm the youngest of the older three. Um, and then there was about a five year gap and, and I've got three younger brothers. Um, so growing up in a family with six boys, um, was pretty exciting. You know, uh, my mom, uh, Tiffany, Tiffany will, will comment about my mom. Like to some people, she's kind of a little scary, you know, but, um, uh, <laughs> She, she was, was a, a Pennsylvania. She, was, oh, I'll step in. Yeah, she yeah. was a Pennsylvania State Hall of Fame field hockey player. So <laughs> that is my mother in law of six boys. Yeah. Does that make sense? She's a little scary to you. Uh, she, she didn't know how to deal with girls. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like she yeah. was a she was a tomboy, you know. She yeah. loves sports and she still does to this day. You know, that yeah. was like uh one of her, her favorite things, you know, uh having six boys, you know, just going to all of our athletic events and 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 things like that, you know. But we would she put us in piano. She likes the arts, you know, things like that. But but at, at the core of who my mom is, she uh, loves athletics. She's she likes to be out on the basketball court. I mean, one one time she uh, rounded the the uh, base uh, in a baseball game, parents against kids, and broke her her finger. I mean, you can still see it to this day, you know. So, 
that's kind of like my childhood uh, growing up. But my parents um, instilled in us a, a work ethic. And so, you know, at a young age, I've got two older brothers. Uh, we were out cutting lawns and doing things like that. And I, you know, before we had a driver's license, you know, my, my mom uh, would drive us to these jobs and she would just sit in the car and, you know, whatever you do back then. I don't know. This was 25, 30 <laughs> years ago, you know, but yeah. um, uh, probably not on the internet much, but maybe just reading her Bible or, or just doing something in the car while waiting on us, right. you know, but um, uh, I, I had a job from a young age. I, I really, um, you know, uh, valued um, working hard for something and, uh, and basically seeing the results of it. Um, so it, as far as like, kind of transitioning from that into real estate. My dad had a couple of rental properties growing up. Um, I seemed to be always his right hand man, you know, I mean, I had older brothers, um, uh, but I was always the one that would be there handing him the tools while he was fixing a water heater or, or, or at a property, you know, he was kind of a do it yourselfer, So he would always be the one to go over there and I would be right there next to him. So I think that's kind of how I got a little bit of a taste for real estate. Um, uh, that was their college plan for us. So mm -hmm. they, they had bought these uh, properties, rented them, you know, all growing up. And then when the three of us older boys started going to college, they sold one of them and kind of used those proceeds to to help assist with college and oh, everything wow. like that. But uh, um, so I went away to college uh, to Cedarville University, which is up in Ohio. Um, I know, a lot, you know, it's near Wright-Patterson Air Force oh, Base. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I have a lot of... Uh, connections now of course with people here at, at Eglin and stuff like that you sure. know just kind of knowing some of those connections but um, my parents bought a house up there and their plan was hey all of us boys are going to end up going to this school and graduating from there uh, so they were like let's just buy a house we're going to save some money on housing you know this sort of thing I'm the only one that went there and graduated ah. so <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't exactly pan out as they planned but i i kind of became a landlord through that i was the one responsible for maintenance and getting roommates and i was gonna say know. did you get roommates oh yeah yeah we had I, I didn't of, even yeah. know that was a thing one of my coworkers <laughs> had mentioned that he goes yeah we actually did the calculations over time and to own a house and then get um actual roommates there is cheaper over time than doing like the room and board situation yes. That's what like, they say, and that was the idea. I think they are thankful that they did it at the end of the day, but they, because the real estate market shifted, uh, they had to keep it a lot longer than they intended. So um, at the end of the day, they probably made a little bit of money on it, but it was a lot of work. Um, you know, it was in a market that wasn't booming. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like they saw a lot of appreciation, you know, I, depending on where properties are, this is always the the rule of thumb, you know, location, location, location. Right. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking back, I would say that they were grateful that they did that. Were you selective on your roommates because you know, you're going to have to fix anything that they messed up. Yeah. Um, you're talking I, about college guys. That's what I'm saying. It's really hard. Uh, I know. What are you studying? Yeah. Physics? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> like you're in. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, we, you know, we had some roommates that I wouldn't say were my best friends. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I will say to this day, my my roommate, my senior year, is my best friend to this day. Wow, really? Um, so he came to us. It's kind of a fluke. I'm not going to go into a long story on it, but his housing situation fell through, and he approached me. We didn't really know each other that well. He mm -hmm. was like, you know, hey, I'm looking for a house. I says, the only thing I have available is you could share a room with me. And uh, he was like, cool, I'll do it. We are best friends to this day. So, <laughs> Like you say share a room like a room. Like We had like the master suite. Wow. So he had a bed on one side of the room. I had a bed on the other side of the wow. room. We shared. So during college, <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but that's cool. Uh, and so what did you go to college for? So my degree is in finance. Um, I thought when I went to school, I was going to be a business guy. So I started out being um, finance and accounting. I quickly learned that accounting is not the same as finance. So mm. I did the required business, you know, core for accounting, but that was it. I'm not a debits and credits kind of guy. So um, I did finance, and then, of course, uh, I got a communications minor. And at Cedarville, we all get a, a minor also in Bible. So Oh, that's cool. Um, but, yeah. So it's a, is it a private or public? It is. It's a private, and is private. it Christian-based? It is. Oh, very cool. Baptist okay. school. <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah, it's my, my father went to a Lutheran school in Seguin, um, Texas. So he's a huge, huge fan. And then my, my sister went for a short period of time. Oh, I almost getting confused. Like, Hillsdale and somewhere, she's going to listen to this and beat me up but anyway so <laughs> she went to one up oh, there's michigan and then somewhere else in wisconsin when, when she stayed and when i don't remember she moved to one um but yeah same same boat right like 
And I think that's important. I, you know, depending on how you, how you go through life, that's an important thing to have even like, right. Cause you're like a kid, you grew up in that environment and now you're away from your parents and that really su- that support group and having something you're familiar with in the college setting is, is quite nice. So that's, that's a cool, that's a cool I, thing. I loved my college experience and I'm actually going for my 20 year reunion oh, uh, your ears in the him. fall. <laughs> and uh, my son is, is a seventh grader. He'll be going into eighth grade next year. And you know, we're going to, we're going to take them with us and uh, introduce wow. them to Cedarville. So that's um, cool. Yeah. Super excited about are you that. Gonna, are you laying the breadcrumb like, the, oh yeah. Like, Here yeah, you I go. think so. I think yeah. especially for, you know, our, we have two boys and then a girl, but just like, I don't know, our older son is super independent. We joke that like he came out of the womb filling out college entrance exams already. <laughs> so we we think that he's just like ready to go, right? He's 12. He's starting a little lawn business. Oh, wow. And so, you know, running him around to lawn jobs all the time. And so he's super, I think, like us in that sense, like hardworking and yeah. um, just think, forward thinking and thinking about what he wants to do in 10 years. And so we love it. So we're trying to cultivate that and like starting this, start this process early and making college an appealing uh, prospect. It's interesting to say that a lot of the people that I have on that are entrepreneurs now, um, even my buddy, like Jim Getz that did the Big B Coffee, mm-hmm. um, uh, a little bit of Logan and, and some other people have, have said at some point, either their parents or themselves started doing entrepreneurial things at a young age and that helped transition like to the point where they were comfortable enough and end up getting their own business at some point. Maybe not starting off that way, but eventually um, working for themselves and having their own company, which is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. So. Uh, no, I appreciate that, Andrew. That was that was good. Anything else that you want to add to that experience? I think we're good for now. <laughs> <laughs> so do any of your um, brothers actually live here, near here? Oh, that's all about to change. Oh, yeah. That's None an interesting. Until we are Saturday. <laughs> and that's right. Yeah, we've so, got a few coming back to the area, but no, not for a long time. Really? Yeah. Because you had what one's a doctor that was in, in over Haiti overseas somewhere, is that yeah, right? Yeah, India and Southeast Asia. That's right. Yeah. Two of them. Two. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Not yeah. two doctors, but oh, two uh, brothers. Two, yeah, I have a doctor overseas. brother in California. Oh wow. Um, okay. And then one overseas. Um, they're coming tomorrow actually. Um on a little furlough. Okay. Um, so they're missionaries overseas. Right. And um uh but yeah, it you know, just through the the evolution of schooling and, and jobs and everything like that. Sure. Um, uh, people have moved away and, and now that they're getting older, establishing families and things like that, you know, my uh, brother and his family that live out in Denver, he's, he's a realtor out there and um, uh, they're moving to the area. Um, I think next week they wow. will arrive and um, uh, he's going to be working with us at sound choice as well, which is wow. pretty exciting, but uh, That's so cool. Yeah. And then uh, Jonathan and his family, they've got six boys or six children um, as well, but, uh, they're, they're returning from, uh, the mission field tomorrow and kind of for an undetermined amount of time. We're not sure right now. They're, yep. they're supposed to be on a furlough, which should be about six months, but, um, um, they don't, they haven't solidified their plans. I gotcha. But yeah. Um, so it's exciting. Wow, man. That's yeah. So there's a lot of Tidwells that are going to be a lot. That's right. A lot. <laughs> Like, hey, do you know? Yeah, that's my brother. The brother, brother, brother. Like, yeah. <laughs> like round robin, round robin. Wow, that's really exciting. Well, that's good. That's, I, yeah, it, it is right. This is like a really good community for families. It's yep. even even with the additional um, storage unit and mail chain versus stuff. Oh my gosh, that's so, a whole other podcast. It's thing. for sale again. I read this morning. Which one? The mullet. Oh, the mullet storage. Third time in wait. Two the years mullet or... storage by Blue Water Bay. That oh, one. The or... one right there next to the Presbyterian. Church. The one that has the big fish on the side. That's of it. right. The mullet. You think we should <laughs> all buy it and tear it down? That's, That's what they nice... so, said. Do you want to hear something crazy? <laughs> and then we'll transition. But this is tangential. It's, it makes sense. I was visiting my buddy up in D.C. and I was driving and I couldn't believe the data warehouses. Have you ever seen a data warehouse like? No. The server. So everyone talks about the cloud. Well, there has to be something that stores all this data, processes this data, transmit whatever. Giant concrete buildings. Wow. Giant, multiple ones, right? Security out the yin yang, right? Mm-hmm. You got the the bob wire, whatever around it, and gates. Giant. And I go, it's funny because at some point, just like mainframes, we'll probably get to the point with cubics, right? Right with the quantum computing, mm-hmm. which will eventually go to some form of do we need storage or not? Because everything's happening in real time, anyways that will reduce the size, potentially, maybe it goes bigger, I don't know. I think with that technology comes other technology for storage purposes because they can condense it, anyways, and compress it. So I'm like, there's, as a real tour, I'd be like, those are giant concrete buildings, what could I do inside? Uh-huh. How many pickleball courts right, could I right, put in? Right, right. Like, just right. all this, like, I think yes. more like housing. 
you know. Well, it's it's <laughs> no no it's real. Have you ever watched uh, or read the story Real Player One? No. No. Real oh, Player One. You should do it. It's okay. a really good book. Movies like it's it's one of the better movies based off a book. Um, and I forget the author off the top of my head. Everyone's gonna beat me up about it. Anyways, so they have the like cargo shipping containers stacked on top of each other. They even call it the stacks is where they live. And I always think about that. And that's the same boat like you, right? If you knock, if you have storage units and you combine maybe two, depending on the size, 10 by 20 or whatever. Yeah. You could have like tiny home living yeah. things in there, right? I no think big that's deal. in the contract. You're not allowed to stay overnight or something. Yeah. But if you buy the building. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you buy the building. So have you guys been to Huntsville, Alabama? Yes. Have you been to that big school that they turned into? It has pizza shop, a brewery. Um, it has a speakeasy, it has a dance hall. I think I have been there. Yeah. Yes, I have. So it's, it's cool to see what you can do with something like that. And I've been to another one very similar in Colorado. So I'd be, I'd be curious to go, okay, like what's the framework inside a storage unit and like how, how much would it be to convert it to something, to something? Yes. So I think in our industry, that's sort of like the downside, right? So everywhere we go, we're looking at like, oh, what could be done here? What could be done here? So we were in Pensacola last weekend for my son's baseball tournament. And we're driving by this like back area of Pensacola. And you see this huge, like abandoned brick, like former military Mm -hmm. post or something. And this beautiful brick. And all I could focus on was this brick is beautiful. What could we do? And I lived in the Philadelphia area before Andrew and I met. That's where we met. And um, Spoiler alert. They would yep. do this. <laughs> they would do this in these like old Philadelphia, like abandoned areas and turn them into these amazing condos. Mm-hmm. Um, and it ended up being like this cool, you know, revitalization. Uppity, like, I, yeah, I, love that kind I loved of it. And so that is sort of like I was joking before we started the podcast. Like, if Andrew and I go on vacation, we're staying in like a VRBO property. Andrew will be like examining, like, okay, are the are the cabinet faces aligning correctly? Or did they you know, you know, lay the quarter round properly. It's just all these little <laughs> things that we're like nitpicking and always thinking about. So you really can't escape the industry mm-hmm. that you're sort of married to, you know, when, when we're out and about, if that yeah. makes sense. I wrote a, so. I wrote a paper and then we'll, we're going to get into your history, Tiffany. So yeah. I wrote a paper a long time ago, a business paper. It was a, almost a charter plan. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. So I actually, I, I know someone's going to steal it from here because someday this will go out and there'll sure. be a lot of listeners. So copyright Schleif incorporated people have value <laughs> experience, LLC. It's going to happen. Don't, don't steal this. So anyways, you take a big old brick building and you break it into like, basically it's like a third and two thirds. So the third, so think big brick, building, like you've seen the old factories or whatever, a third becomes an Irish pub and it'll be like a first and second story. Cause a lot of the older, you know, brick buildings are multiple stories. So yeah. however big it is, right. So you go two, three stories, whatever. Right. So that's a third of it. So this is nice Irish pub, Good food, Irish food, good beer, and good healthy food, right? Grilled chicken and so on. I'll tell you why. The other two-thirds is a gym, and the other two-thirds is section and quad, basically four sections. One section's an old-school dungeon powerlifting, right? Like chains, huh. rusted equipment. The other quarter is a rental space for spin cycling, for Tybo, which is like, that's telling yeah, my age. Yeah, Billy Blank. Right. I know. The other the other quarter is it's- CrossFit, right? Or I would say almost like the other two quarters, right, would be like a CrossFit gym because you do need that space, right? So you have the rental space, right, which is the new and upcoming because there's a fad. It changes all the time, whatever that's spinning or whatever it is. The other one, which is like the old school, like, I just want to go throw some weight around. And then you have the, like, high intensity area for the the CrossFit and other stuff. And then, so the goal is for membership is if you have a membership, you get like one free beer and maybe a meal or whatever a month at the Irish pub, which is going to draw them into the Irish pub. They get used to the food, whatever else. Cool. Now the second story and third story above the gym is going to be apartments Mm. and the apartments are going to be housed by vets, vets that are having a difficult time. So it's free room and board, but they work at the gym. Yes. I love it. I love that it. was. I wrote like That's a whole awesome. business plan. It, it was like awesome. So you take advantage Where of the whole building. This? Oh God, um, a long time ago. Wow, that's impressive. A long time ago. Yeah, yeah let's do that with a storage unit. I would. <laughs> I love it. I mean, th- the whole part was like how. Like I see these vets and they're struggling and like they want to yeah. work. I'm like, how how can we do this? And like the hardest part is like if you give them room and board in a good environment and and sense of purpose every day, Absolutely. right? You know, there's laundry that comes with the gym, like cleaning the bathrooms, checking in people, like you know, some low key, low skill sets type of thing. Keeps them occupied. They don't have to worry about where to stay, right? It's up there. You give them, right, the Irish pub, like we'd, we'd have some, right, we have to work the revenue situation, but like <laughs> have some meals, like here you go, guys, right? So it's all part of that working scheme is the room and board, which, you know, hopefully minimal electricity, water, all, all that overhead that comes with that anyway. So anyways, that, that would be my, my I love it. 
Okay. I love it. Tiffany. Okay. Thank you for letting me go down Segway. that path. You copyrighted that. <laughs> it's okay. That's right. Darn I right. I would support that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Please, Tiffany, give us your background. Okay. So I would say that like similarly, Andrew and I have, you know, grew up in families where we just had to be hard working. So I think that that has served us well in our adult life and in our business. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find many harder working people than us. <laughs> um, if I had to be honest, but, um, I grew up in Montana, which is really weird because I think for like all through my twenties and I was in college, um, I would hear from people, I've never met anyone from Montana before I thought, really, or that I'd get questions like, do they have electricity? Like, do you guys like <laughs> ride horses to school? No, this like we have, country. we have a car, <laughs> I had a car in high school. So that's none of that is true, but yeah, I grew up in Montana and I think, um, just like blue collar parents. And, you know, I had a job since I was 12. So I've always worked. I like to work. I get a lot of satisfaction from working and working hard. So that's, it's the large part of my story, I guess. And then put myself through college. So I, you know, I was, didn't have a family that could afford that. And so I worked three and four jobs, um, and didn't go into debt. That's a whole nother, mm -hmm. you know, story we could talk about, like this whole myth about like going to college debt and everyone having to pay all these student loans. It's ridiculous. You don't have to, but anyway, that's a strong opinion I have, but <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you can Love work. It. You don't have to party your way through school. So, uh -huh. right. um, yeah. I worked really hard. So, um, yeah. I'm, pr I'm proud of that. And then, uh, after graduating, I moved, um, I lived so in South Florida for a while. What was your degree? You didn't tell So it. communications degree. I thought oh. I was going to law school. Oh. Um, yeah. My husband could tell I'm really, she didn't. really good at arguing so, <laughs> and winning. Well, I'm good at winning arguments too. There you go. So yep. thought I was going to law school, but then graduated and I had been nannying for a family through college. Oh, wow. And the family that I nannied for owned a, owned a company. Um, they were a married couple, they owned a company a respiratory company, a respiratory pharmacy, and a durable medical equipment company. And I started working just like filing paperwork and answering the phones. And then a sales position opened. And I, I said, I think, I, I think I'd like that job. And they said, okay, let's try it. Wow. So I, I was given an opportunity and did really well, actually. Wow. So I, I loved it. I loved the autonomy of it. I love this idea of controlling your own destiny mm -hmm. controlling your own paycheck like sort of this commission i i loved every part of it and so um was very successful in that and i moved up and was a sales manager there so from there um long story but i moved to the philadelphia area um I, all my my parents are from philadelphia all my extended family lives in you know the northeast and so i moved to philadelphia and um worked for a pharmaceutical company so i worked for doing pharmaceutical sales. And then when Andrew and I met through his, when he mentioned his best friend from college, um, I, they also lived there at the time and that's how we were introduced. Oh, wow. And so that's really cool. But, um, I ended up working, I was a sales manager for a district sales manager for a pharmaceutical company, uh, when Andrew and I met. So, um, that is my background. Wow. So, yeah, that's not, so did you have brothers and sisters growing up? I have or? one sister. One she sister. lives in Montana. I'm okay. married up. And my parents in Montana. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds like an Andrew. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so. So, so did you, like, what what part of me, like, Butte, like, where in Montana? So I grew up in a very small town in between Helena and Bozeman. Oh, okay. So what is it called? Townsend, okay. Montana. So I watch, there's um, uh, Rob Bailey and Dana Lynn Bailey. Uh, they own, like, multiple companies. Flagner Fells, they're, like, anyway, so... They moved to Montana and, and Courtney wants to go to Montana very much. So like that's her like off the grid, just like go away June. from people. Like, okay, so. I have an opinion. You ready? I grew up like meeting all of these people that were like, we're, we've always wanted to move to Montana. It sounds, it sounds like so romantic living off the grid and living in the woods and they would oh. last one winter. Oh yeah. No, no. One winter. So, so I, sorry, they're they're done. I meant off the grid, like not a lot of people, not off the grid, like no yeah. electric, no, yeah. like, sorry, <laughs> let me, let me be very clear. Yes. We're not, we watch that. So the Alaska shows, like my parents have watched every Alaska grid on, off, whatever you name it. We've watched every like alone series out there, not the naked and afraid, but the alone, like where they're building their own shelters. Yeah. Like though I would say everything is mostly staged, but the more sure. legitimate out of those, we've also seen some beautiful like hey let me sell some kidneys and make it rich houses slash mansions in montana Absolutely. and i'm yeah. like yes i would do that right like if it was a self-sustained self-sustained like solar panels to save electricity during the winter you have to like move the snow off i, I get it no i get it i mean 
I'm not it's the guy. Hard. I mean, I yeah, say, I'm and, and a lot, I think a lot of people that live here, like in Niceville specific, specifically, come from other areas, right? Because of the military, yeah. so like Minnesota and you know Michigan and Montana, you know Washington State, and I think they would understand that. You know, I had to plug my car in every night so the engine block didn't oh, freeze. Yeah. I had to wake up before you know going to high school and scrape my car windows for a long time. You know, so it was. I describe it as not easy. Yeah. yeah, it's not easy. It sounds romantic and beautiful. It's just not easy, yeah. right? So. Romanticized. It's it's a mm-hmm. romanticized idea, but Correct. when you're there in it, right? That's the whole thing. Is like I always tell people because they're like, oh, I want four seasons. I'm like, listen, find a base like Florida, and then vacation or yes. go to these yes. other places, right? Yeah. And then just have a good base yeah. here, right? Like, don't. I mean, hey, listen, I love California. My cousin lives in California, but I would never go there. Uh, oh, man, I love it, too. <laughs> Unless you want it to, like, float away and attach to Guam or something. I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. That's for probably sure. geographically not even correct. For but sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for about your yeah. background. So, okay. I want to dig a little bit deeper. And so you guys met in Philly? So his, his college roommate and I, his wife and I were friends. And they he was visiting randomly through for a funeral. This and... wasn't the first time. Oh, well, they introduced me to her at church it, one time, but she was dating a guy. They were trying to get her not to be dating that guy. So they were introducing me. But in my mind, I'm like, she's taken. So I kind of. Because it was her. in church. Well, that too. <laughs> fair, hey, man. No, fair no, I, see point. I see. I see, I see what's going anybody. on, right? Like, <laughs> I get it. I get it. She's with the guy. Commit. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so. But anyways. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we, um, Andrew and I met, he sort of. We'll talk about this later, I think, in the podcast. One of the questions talks about like social media, right? And at the time, social media was really starting to like take off. Yeah. 2008, something. And yes, I remember Andrew, like us meeting and we had met at our friend's house and he didn't ask me for my number. And then through social media, he sends me a message and says, hey, I, I failed to ask you for your phone number. And he said, I really don't want to do this thing where we communicate on Facebook. And I was like, I like that person because I hate Facebook. So I, <laughs> I kind of don't see the point of social media. So I liked that. And I was like, okay, here's my phone number. And so we um, met and married in under a year, mostly long distance. And he was here in Niceville. I was there. Um, I mentioned I had worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And in that industry, there's a lot of layoffs that happen all the time. Basically, mm. a product might go off patent and then you, yep. um, they you know, wipe out their sales force. I was in a contracted sales force. And mm-hmm. so you can just pick up another contract. Um, but I was, it was really great timing because we just decided as we were talking about getting married, I was just going to move to Niceville and we would, I would pick up a contract here. And so yeah. that's what I did. Oh. Um, but in yeah. the and to transition into real estate, that's when I, you know, moved here. We were just married, obviously no kids. Um, I got my real estate license right away because I thought, oh, well, maybe I, if I don't get picked up on another contract or just I don't do this long term, mm-hmm. then I always have this license. Right. So like in two weeks, I was able to at the time with no other commitments, really, I could just. You just, got your license in two weeks? I think I did. It was really fast. I just like studied all day long. It took to get a broker's license recently. Yeah, yeah. So I recently got my broker's license and just passed the state exam few weeks ago wow. and um that one took me six months to study for only because now we have three kids we're running right. a business so yep. i have very little headspace for studying sure like that i call that an excuse just kidding <laughs> sure <laughs> sure, sure. Just, i, I just call kidding. it a reason just not just an excuse <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but so anyway that's that so i got my license and then have always sort of you know been slightly a part of the the business and have and then as time has gone on, now I'm full time of the business. So just a little bit more all the time, depending on, you know, we had, we've had three kids in the middle of all this. Yeah. And, and what's the ages now that you have? So we are at 12, 10 and nine, two boys and a girl. That's They're so awesome. No, no diapers, no bottles. No, it's it's not, we're wonderful. in the sweet spot. Oh, can you imagine? I, know. I, know. No, I, I actually cannot. <laughs> I literally cannot imagine that. There's, this, there's a parenting phase called the sweet spot where it's, you're done with diapers. You're done with the car seats. You are... <sighs> Um, done with naps, your kids still like you and they want to <laughs> hang out with you. They kind of think you're cool before they now they, you know, pretty soon, like we're our son's going to start thinking his friends are way cooler than us. Or maybe so another year. We're still in the sweet spot and it is really fun. That's, I think it's a great, I love parenting. I, I think we have great kids and I, I think that, um, we're just in a great space. So if you're not there yet, Life. We're like, the funny thing is we're <laughs> Riley. We're, we flipped. Yeah, Dad, that's not cool. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool embarrassed. Yeah, it's so I embarrassed. Know. We get 
with that a little bit. Like I, I tell my son, I'm going to buy a shirt that says um, weird moms build character and wear it to all his <laughs> baseball games, all his soccer games. I love that. Yeah. Build some character. I, I, mm-hmm. I did this morning, literally this morning, I'm dropping Riley off and she's like, go a little bit further. I'm like, the gate's right there, Riley. Like, let me just go a little bit. For- no, I'm stopping right here. She opens the door. <laughs> she gets out. I roll down the window. I love you, Riley. Have yes. a great day. And the teacher's like, yeah. Yes. And she's like, like yes. <laughs> yes. every just day. Clamoring, is, that, right? is that not normal? <laughs> I mean, I do as often as possible. <laughs> I <don't>. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, I will totally embarrass you as uh-huh. long as Absolutely. I can get away with it. You know, like. <laughs> and you're I, saying you love them. They need to hear that every day. You're absolutely. doing I, I don't care if they don't want to hear it. You got to tell them that. Yep. yep. Lots of hugs and yep. oh my friends are looking, Dad. I'm like, So what? That's yep. right. So what? You gotta get in there. But weird. <laughs> they actually all want that. Her. They do. Oh yeah. They do want that. Subconsciously. And she got braces, so she's like, I ain't this yeah. Ball. yeah. Middle school, right? Ruckle. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, no one has ever said I want to go back to middle school. Those are great years. Uh, no one ever says those are hard years for And anybody. you know the female time yeah. and like all No. <laughs> It is a well, like as a dad too, right? The transition and like all oh, of that. Yeah. So, so like like yourselves, right? The whole parenting side and then business side, and so being an entrepreneur and having these other reasons, right? reasons, yes, reasons, <laughs> reasons. <laughs> reasons for for prioritizing, right? Um, like like so, it's it's interesting, right? Courtney and I are talking to somebody, and and they're very much into the like, hey, you have to prioritize your relationship first, right? Over other things, right? Kids are there. You got it. You got to support and help yep. them, but y'all have to have this relationship. And it's even more interesting when not only do you have a marriage relationship, but you have a business partner yes. relationship, right? Yes. Hence, like I said, the tattoo sisters. And I asked like, were y'all warned ahead of time? Hey, like maybe you shouldn't do this. Right. And their dad had an experience, I think working with his brother and it was sort of like, just be careful, but they're like, they're, they, they complement each other so well. So That's have cool. y'all like, so you met, oh, well, let's, I want to, I want to get a little bit further in the Met start and then we'll get further, but, or, uh, to the whole, like being business partners, but like, so, so you guys met and you said you met, got married under a year, long distance more. So how much travel in that time frame, that year time frame did y'all do? Just to tell you, um, this wasn't that long ago, but I was flying on an airline called Northwest. They merged with Delta, but anyways, I, people might remember Northwest, uh, <laughs> Probably at least once a month I was flying up there. She was coming here. Yeah. At that point, I was in real estate, of course, but um, she was in pharma. I would say she had the better job than me um, at that point in the relationship. And so, you know, I had a little more time on my hands. Uh, this was 2008, so the real estate market was a little bit crazy, um, uh, depressed at that point, um, uh, just kind of starting the first phase of, of the recession, so to speak, in real estate. So, um uh, you know, I was traveling up there at least once a month, getting lots of sky miles on Northwest. Um, <laughs> once a month. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, Are they straight flights at least? No, I had to stop in Memphis. Oh, wow. Yep. So what, so what was the time? Like it was like an hour and a half to Memphis and then like another hour ish. Basically. To, yep. So like two and a half to three hour flight time, you have to get at the airport hour to two hours back in the day it's probably like an hour ahead of time dude i've got some stories man i was because i would fly out of pensacola uh, often uh, a little bit cheaper over there you know um and uh man sometimes i would leave niceville like an hour and a half before my flight would take off um because i was just like getting the hang of this i, I had like a you know a carry-on bag and everything and, and dude i was so nervous i was gonna miss my flight one time. It was ridiculous. I, I i've only had once once where i like checked a bag walked in walked right through the gate uh-huh. on yeah. like yeah. there was because just the time Happens. frame worked out but other than that now it's like did you see there was a recent thing like, hey, get to our local airport like two hours ahead yes. because it's just getting nuts. Yes. Like it's just yeah. getting crazy over there. Wow. That's yeah. so once a month. So, yeah. so how, did you come back at all during that? Or was it per, like, I mean, is it 70%, 80% you traveling? And then she came back. That, like, I think it was mostly Andrew traveling at that point. Wow. And I was she up came there. down at Thanksgiving that year. We met in February, I think. April, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> we got engaged in February. So, yeah. oh, that, no. means, that means we met in August. Yes. We met in we August. Did. She August. came to visit my, I'm to wrong. meet my family for Thanksgiving. Very overwhelming. Year. I love it. Six Very brothers. overwhelming. A lot of people. Field hockey mama. Yes. And five brothers. Yes. That was also. Oh. Not only that. They, Wait a minute. 
do, do you remember this part? Andrew's brothers and some friends, like family friends, guys that he grew up with, took me to breakfast without as, me, without him, <laughs> as like a interview, as like an e interview. Like, are you good enough for him? Oh my gosh, Can yeah. you imagine? Wow. I I Ridiculous. did it. I went and I. Held my own. Obviously, I'm <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, she's listen, a we've keeper. been married for 15 years, so I'm, you know, I'm still here. So <laughs> we're good. We're good. That is pretty. This amazing. could be a marriage podcast, actually, because, <laughs> because we work together. We're married. Like anyway, we could we could be here all day. Well, People ask a, us that important. all the time about uh, yeah. about working together. Yeah. And um, I mean, we kind of run two different phases of the business. So I'm more on the right. sales side. She runs our property management business, um, and you know, in that respect, she's kind of got the things that she's doing and I've got the things that I'm doing, but we love working together. We do. Um, it, it's great. Uh, I mean, we wouldn't have it any other way. And, and, and really people do question us on all, all the time. Like they don't believe that we work well together and there are days, but there are going to be days if you have a business partner that you're not married to. Yeah. There's everyone has days. Sure. So it, but I think that doesn't characterize the, the nature of our business, the nature of our working to the nature of our marriage. Like you have days, but I, I think we do a really good job. Um, and I think we trust each other. And I also think that we, I think this is required. I think it's required of a good marriage and it's required of a good business partnership, but we sharpen each other. So we're human. We, we see, he sees my holes and I see his holes and we see, you know, um, where we need to get better all the time. Like we certainly don't run a perfect business. We're not perfect people, but we, I think that he's good at things that I'm not good at and I'm good at things that he's not good at. And so that, it works well. Mm -hmm. So it's funny you talk about that, the marriage thing and the relationship. So <laughs> excuse me, whether you're a friend or married, I think it's important because there's all this, this root stuff, right? So there's a surface thing about talking about real estate, a realtor, realtor, and Real having the licensing and being able to test and having the communication skills, but like having a business partner in the relationship, there's, there's stuff to peel back that I don't think people really talk about because the stronger relationship is, and again, whether it's delineation or separation of roles and you guys both recognize strengths and weaknesses, strengthens the business at large, right? Yeah. So there's there's a direct representation of a strong relationship into a successful business, right? Like, because y'all know, right? You, you know, like, oh, there's a little bit of falter here. I'm going to pick that up or vice versa. Um, or like, hey, I know you got this because this is your strength, right? And yeah. I'll handle this other area or whatever. And, and again, that's it could be marriage. It could be best friends. It could be not be best friends. It could just be a really strong relationship in general. And I think that's correct. So why, while you say that, I, I think there is some direct translation to that strength and relationship y'all have and that recognition to being successful business people. Yeah. And also, you know, have you heard the phrase like, oh, it's not business is personal. That doesn't work for us. I mean, I think everything is personal. And I think when it even just comes to um, helping people in like the home buying and selling process or investing in property management, um, that is personal. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this all the time. Andrew and I, you'll find are very, very passionate about like personal finance and diligence mm -hmm. with that. And so not, you know, living below your means and right. all of these things. Um, we have a lot of like really, I'd say strong opinions about that. Um, so we're passionate about, um, kind of translating that into what we do and mm -hmm. how we're helping people. And the reality is that one's home for most, for the average American family, that is the largest investment, yep. that the largest financial investment they will ever have. All and right. so it is important to us to be good stewards of that, to give good advice, to not just be transactional in nature, but to be a resource for someone mm -hmm. and give good financial advice, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So. What, what you can without being listened to. Uh, so yeah, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that's something and right. Like, Transparency, right? You're a realtor since we moved here, uh, right? Yeah, absolutely. Bought and sold. I know, man. And bought, bought, sold, and bought a house. Right. That was back in the early uh, days of me investing in Zillow. So you found me on yeah. on Zillow before it, it was a big thing. You know what I'm saying? That's so, yeah, that's um, true. That really helped to catapult my career. Um, honestly, um, uh, taking a risk on that, and um, uh, people around me were like, "Why? Why?" would you be, you know, investing money in on Zillow? And I was just like, cause I see some value in it mm -hmm. and uh, you found us there yep. and uh, look, at, look at where we're at today. I know so. <laughs> in my house, but you help buy. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I think what I'd like to do is ask now. So we got your backgrounds respectively, um, got together, got married. Um, when, when Andrew, did you actually, cause you said you're, you were doing, you were a real estate agent. 
Okay. That sounds right. Yeah, Real estate agent prior to like, as you met her or whatever. So, and you said your dad had always worked on houses. So when was that? Tra- okay. So first off, did you start working for someone else? And then when did you transition to actually like having your own company? How did that work? So, um, in the state of Florida, you have to, um, have a sales license first and the only requirement um, to qualify then to move to the next level which is a broker um, is two years of experience Um, so basically i got licensed in 2003 which was actually in the summer between my junior and senior year of college um, with the anticipation of that's what i was going to do when i graduated um, so I graduated college, you know, all your buddies are, are, you know, looking for work and some, most have jobs lined up before, but some don't. Um, I kind of knew, you know, well in advance what I was planning to do. Um, so I kind of felt like my senior year, I was just able to, you know, not coast per se, mm-hmm. but I wasn't worried about the job. Right. Um, so anyways, I uh, graduated college, moved back home. I did move back in with my parents. Solid. Um, <laughs> oh, till we solid. got married, yeah. I did buy some investment property, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep living for free at home and rent that thing out. Perfect. So, um, <laughs> Makes sense. anyways, kind of got a little jump start there, but, um, basically 2007 happens. Um, the market's starting to, to shift the broker that I was working for at that time. I uh, wanted to kind of just minimize liability, minimize responsibility. And so all of her, um, sales associate, she was basically asking to, to find another place to work. Mm. A sales associate has to hang their license under a broker. Mm. Broker's ultimately responsible for everything that's done by the sales associates. Um, so at that point, I kind of had a decision to make. Um, I interviewed with other brokerages, some of the big name firms out there. And, mm-hmm. and But because I was kind of always entrepreneurial minded, um, I says, you know what, I'm going to take a chance at it. I'm going to go get my broker's license and I'm going to start my own business. Um, this was in 2007, um, oh. a year before we met, um, you know, we meet in 2008, um, uh, you know, we're just kind of plugging along in the real estate game at that point. But, um, so we met in 2008, married in 2009, 2009 is actually when we decided that we were going to add the, the property management, uh, wing of our business mm-hmm. because sales were so inconsistent so, and unpredictable. So wait, so Maybe I'm missing it. So did you, so 2008 is when you stood up the business? Your own? Uh, 2007. Sorry. Okay. So 2007 is when you stood up Sound Choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. I missed that part. So 2007, you stood up Sound Choice. Okay. Yep. And at the time I was, I I had kind of actually delved into the world of, um, of finance a little bit because what I would find is I was, um, directing my clients and doing all the research on what loan options were best for them, et cetera, et cetera. And I had a client that was working with a lender and they were like, dude, you should go get your, you know, your loan officer's license, because if you're given that recommendation, you can get paid for being, a, you know, for basically selling a loan as well, uh, you know, in conjunction with, with doing the real estate. So I did get my LO license and did that for a little bit, but I quickly learned that was a conflict of interest. Mm. Um, so I would just refer business, um, uh, to this lender at that mm-hmm. time, but uh, he and I um, uh, were kind of the impetus to get Sound Choice Real Estate started uh, during that phase when I was working with with that gentleman. But I um, uh, just went on on our own. I mean, at that time, I didn't have a physical office location. You know, being in real estate, you can do it from anywhere. Right. Okay. But as our business has grown, I've just uh, realized that it's good to have a physical location. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the, in the age of remote work and everything like that, I love having a physical location. I like going to the office every day. Um, so we bought a small place in, in Blue Water Bay, um, in Merchants Walk. And basically when we outgrew that, we moved to our current location about two years ago. Next to Wanda Coffee. Next to Wanda. Yeah. I Um, thought I was going to bring a Wanda Coffee today. Amazing. Yeah. I went Mm -hmm. there, wrote a review on them. I want to have them in sometime. Yeah. Uh, They're awesome. He's great. Parker is awesome. He's incredible. Everyone should go get a cup of coffee today. It's that uh, old fashioned coffee or whatever that they have. It is amazing. So addicting. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) In the best way, no alcohol, but it's super good. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. We love it. It's super good. Yeah. I saw that when I drove by and I was like, oh, right. That's a great spot. Like, yeah. Well, it's a great spot. There are days where we, you know, we bought that building and we thought we should have torn this thing down and started over. I mean, it was built. Wait, so you own the whole building? We do. With Taco Town on the end. And then there's still the health place, right? No. So there's a counseling center. There's a, Ah. 
there is um it's the nerd lab she does like stem classes oh, that's cool. and she does some engineering um testing mm -hmm. and then we have a new um a new tenant coming on the end that will be like health drinks kind of like a daily oh, okay. dose a little bit different with the right. photography he does photography so we do that in the back but very cool yeah, yeah, yeah we that's we're 100 percent full now which we're stoked about wow. yeah we're that's excited great. we're some yeah. businesses that we love like you said wanda everyone loves wanda oh so yeah we, we, they're great we've been very um selective um uh intentionally like we had people that wanted to come into the end unit and it was going to be a conflict with the counseling center mm -hmm. and so we just we, we care. We went to them and asked them and they said, no, we, we don't think that would be good for our business. And so we said, OK, we're not going to sign them up, you know. Right. Wow. So we sat vacant for a little bit longer, being selective, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited about this new uh, business. They're supposed to be open in June 1. So wow. right now they're working on interior build out. Yeah, that's great. But yeah, super exciting. That's really cool. Yeah. So we so. Do dove into the world of commercial um, commercial property management. Yeah. Not uh, just for ourselves. But yeah. Yeah. You guys like is there is there an area that you haven't touched yet? <laughs> no, I'm being serious. I was being serious. Like, is there? Yeah. Like, yeah, but we not don't do but commercial not commercial real estate. That's what I was gonna say. Not yeah. buying, selling. No, commercial we yet. don't do commercial real estate. I don't think. I don't know. Until the storage the unit. Uh, well, yeah, I, don't I know. know. <laughs> until, you, until you open your business, oh, and we'll listen, help you with that. Right. My yeah, brother Ben actually loves commercial real estate, and we'll so see. I could see him kind of creating <sighs> a, a commercial sound choice. Uh, division. So we're, we kind of have divisions, you know, residential sales, residential property management in here. We're going to delve into commercial. Hey, listen, then. if you have a room someday and you're like, man, it's a little bit bigger than this office and hey. you have very low overhead, extremely low overhead. Yes. <laughs> while I love using my office at some point, if I had a people at value experience yes. site, that'd be great. I would share it by the way, share, share, sure, share like, space. like, Hey, this guy has like, you know, 90% of this, but there's this back room. Yep. So here, on board. You know, here you go. We should talk about you this. You can because... do that with um, a sh shared uh, co-working space. Yeah. Yeah. You, I watched the whole WeWork special. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know so what that was? No. There's not one in Niceville, though. <laughs> I and I'm know. Aware Destin, of this. Destin has one, but. We thought about making our end unit into a co-sharing space and, mm. and I just didn't want to have so to So here, I have, a, I have a business proposition for you. So <laughs> if we, if we. It's open, real time. It's real time. If we open a space. So I have been. Copyright. This is funny. I've actually talked. I joke about it. Like I have no spare time right now, but. I joke about like, I'm going to start up, I'm going to do a podcast about property management. And Fantastic. this stemmed from, there's um, a, a woman that works in our office who is great. One of our, we love her. She's a great employee. And she uh, used to work in apartment leasing before she came to work for us. Wow. And she follows like blogs and social mm -hmm. media, all these nightmare stories about property management mm -hmm. and trashing out apartments and just hilarious. And she's sharing these stories with us all the time. And I, you know, as we have grown in property management, we've done this for a while, we have some stories to tell. Oh, yeah. And it is hilarious. I love it. You would, people would, I think people would love to listen to it. It just it. is entertaining. 100%. And um, so I joke, I have a friend who's a real estate broker in North Carolina, and she has like bats in an attic story. And I oh. had a golf cart in the middle of the bay this year. Like we have stories. <laughs> so... We joke that we're going to start a podcast and just tell yeah. our stories. Then we're going to invite other property managers on to tell their stories. And it's going to be, people will love it. <laughs> I mean, listen. So I'll share your space with I, you. I will, listen, if you want to like get started down that <laughs> and you want to do the first couple and you don't mind me sitting in and you run 90% of it and I'll just hang out. Okay. I, I am more than welcome to do that. Funny enough, my so my cousin, the music producer, artist over in California had a client um, whose brother was a famous guy and he calls me, he's like 70, he's like, Hey, I'm trying to start a podcast with my friends and blah, blah, blah. So he like, he's written like scripts and for movies and all this stuff anyways. So I'm like, yeah, dude, here's the equipment, blah, blah. He eventually like found some other equipment that worked better, but like, I'm all about helping other people do it. Right. I think it's like about again, adding value and sharing that yeah. or whatever. So if you want to learn like the process and go through that yeah. and someday like dive on, like jump off. Awesome. I, I'm more than willing to, there's different levels and opportunities, but I'm hundred percent on, on board for that. Okay. Also, but if you want to do a couple, two or three, I'm more than willing to, to sit in like, Hey man, I have some Fridays, you know, that I can notch out yeah. and take some PTO on and <laughs> have them over. I would be just as interested to sit there and listen to the stories and that's going to yeah. be her retirement job. Yeah. My retirement. That's job. what I'm saying. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Let's do that. That yeah. sounds so Love fun. It. Shared yeah. podcasting space. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a great idea actually. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, 
so you met so 2007 you stood up the actual brokerage um 2009 i think is where you were at in your timeline yeah. and you started to that's when we uh, started doing property management we property management we have our best business meetings on on trips road trips, road trips. yeah mm -hmm. so we she was still working in pharma at the time and she because she was uh, awarded the top sales um, in her company. We got oh. a trip to Costa Rica, um, but we had to fly out of Orlando. So on the trip to Orlando, we're like business planning and we decided, hey, let's start property management because at that time sales were inconsistent, mm -hmm. not not something that you could count on. We wanted to to be able to build something, build a business where we could have consistent income. And so, well, and, and not only that, it really stemmed from necessity. So there's a lot of clients, right, at that time who purchased homes that could not sell. And so their recourse was to rent them. And sometimes, you know, a lot of time, a lot of them were renting for not what their mortgage was. They're just mm. trying to stay out of foreclosure. And yeah. so there was a something that necessitated providing that option for people that we were working with at the time. Mm. And so um, <laughs> that, <laughs> so that we were able to do that. And that good partnership sort of <laughs> sorry, fixing my microphone. If you're listening and you can't see us. Oh, true. That's great. See, we're fixing each other's holes. That's, 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 that's what we do. <laughs> Farther in the face. Farther right, in the face. Right, that's right. Yep. Um, but, but so anyway, all that to say that segued into um, then property management has grown very organically over time. We wow. have not bought other property management companies. We're not, we're open to that. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've reached out, reached to out few. to a few mm -hmm. from, you know, time to time, but we have just sort of carefully and organically um, grown that because um, that, your overhead has to grow too, right? Right. So you have to yeah. add employees and add processes and software and yeah. and we've done that. So 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 Andrew, I'm curious, right, with the well, you had the the built in employee, right? Like That's built in. Right. So but like how did you approach like your first sales associate? Like how how was that experience, right? Because I'm sure you've worked with people and it was sort of you're like, hey, I'm gonna hire somebody and you already maybe already knew them, but maybe going through the formal interview can you just talk about that? Because that's a big step, right? You're going from sales associate. You're working with a lot of people, almost like at a peer status. Um, like you even started, like as, like you said, right in the college side of the house. Now you're like, I, I definitely want to own my broker, my own brokerage. I'm going to get there. So how did that vetting and how did you go about actually starting to hire your own sales associates? So um, the very first sales associate that worked for me, um, and and pretty much this would be, well, I'll finish this sentence. The the First sales associate I had, um, it was a part-time gig for him, um, but I knew him personally, and that's how I wanted it to be because as the broker, as the responsible person um, for any actions of others, obviously I can't be micromanaging them, and mm -hmm. so I wanted to be able to trust them. Mm -hmm. um, so he was doing real estate as kind of a side gig. He's an appraiser full-time, a very successful appraiser, very busy. Mm -hmm. um, but you know he's lived in Niceville his entire life, so so he's got connections and could could do a handful of real estate transactions, you know, without even thinking about it. Right. Um, so that was kind of the the first, and he's still with me today. Wow. Um. Uh. And and you know, as the business is cyclical, his business has been cyclical, but mm -hmm. but he's had some very successful years, even as a part time associate. That I would say blow people that do it full time out of the water. Wow. I mean, very successful, but. The first full-time agent that I hired was a referral from that agent. Hmm. Um, um, uh, he knew him. Um, the guy was getting out of the military, um, mm -hmm. Curtis. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, he was basically looking for some supplemental income. Um, I think and, I met him. Yeah. Um, so he, Pretty sure I met Curtis. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think he's probably been with us now seven or eight years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's been a while. Um and uh, he's a pastor full time. I definitely met um, him. Yeah, pastor <laughs> yep, yep. full time, and and does real estate to supplement. Um, and and it's something that works really well for him. Um, so he's been with us. Then we got a referral for Jeff in my office, and um, that's kind of I haven't specifically gone out and recruited agents. That's great because the business is so cutthroat from yeah. that perspective. The brokers are just gonna increase your split just to attract you, and I'm, that's not what I'm about. Mm -hmm. I'm about relationships. I'm about um, trust with people. If you can find, you can. You're gonna find a better split somewhere else, but mm -hmm. that, I'm not trying to compete for that business. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess short answer is, I mean, we're always open to, of course, um, having good partnerships and having people that wanna hang their license with me, but we also recognize, we've watched, 
um, agents that have been with multiple brokerages in the last five or or six or eight years. And it's just like, you know, I've been doing this since 2007 as sound choice. I've been doing it since 2003, um, you know, as an industry. And, and this is only the second place that I've worked. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I've just always been very committed. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the world we live in anymore, especially in real estate. Yeah. Um, so can I, can I say something? A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I would, so I'm outside looking in right on like the sales. I don't really, I don't really do sales. Like every once in a while you spill down your shirt. That was <laughs> no one saw that. Yeah. No one saw that. Um, so I'm, you know, seeing this from an outside looking in and I can attest to the fact that I think in any industry you can find that okay. There are exceptions to this for sure, but the most successful people are the people that stay in one spot and work really hard over a period of time and they build something that is worth something. Does that make sense? <laughs> so there's a lot of like, um, I see that in real, I think I, in fact, I can see that in real estate, like locally, if you look at like, okay, who are the top like real estate agents in our area? I think there are people who have done it for a long time and who have, um, just been hard working over a period of time and it's easy in life to like jump Oh, the grass is greener, the grass is greener, the grass is greener, the grass is greener. And um, it's not always like sometimes so, you need to make a shift on um, purpose. But I, I think for us, it has worked to just stay in one spot and work hard and, and build a business. Yeah. I, so I'm thinking about that on long heart. I almost think that's industry dependent. Sure. Because yeah. 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 Fair. Like in the IT world and a cybersecurity world, or I just got done listening to Elon Musk's biography by um, Walter Isaacson, which is uh -huh. highly recommendable, uh -huh. uh, fantastic, a lot, and very, he did Steve Jobs as well. Mm. Like Steve Jobs went like you know Apple, Pixar, like yeah. moved around a little bit. Yes. Elon has stood up multiple companies in his mind, holistic, right from an energy aspect and trying to get people to Mars, and like from his mind. But a lot of I, I, again, right? He didn't he didn't work for other people. He worked for his own, you know, self or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he went into these different industries. But like, there's something to be said that sometimes if people work a certain area, that they they will have a myopic view of an industry, sure. yes. where some industry it's actually required to have more of a breadth of experience to be successful and move up. Because you go, oh, okay, you've only worked. I'm, I'm going to use like IT stuff, or like, oh, you've only done desktops but you've never worked servers or enterprise level or, you know, built server racks or server rooms or understand like the security side of the house. And so there's some, there's some industries that, and like you said, maybe the company they currently work for has that and maybe not. So they, they're able to establish a new role at a different company, which holistically maybe it's five or six different companies they work for, but now their breath across that industry is, is huge, right? The array right. of knowledge has, has gone so that are gone bigger or larger or grown bigger or larger. So now when they want to move up to the next position, they have an understanding of all those roles from a, you could almost say managerial standpoint if they worked at that level, but also from a technical standpoint, because then it all ties together as you, as you go up. So I, I think, I think from a, from a perspective, I agree that it should be intentional. I think people yes. should work in a position intentionally and if it gets hard, don't like, you know, jump and fall off. And I think that's, that's a, a huge point to make. Cause now a lot of people are like looking for the easy button all that's the time. Right. right? But Correct. I, I do the microwave. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But I, I can, I can, re, I can completely respect and understand where you're coming from on that statement. It makes a lot of sense. And I, and I, I think that's even more true in the entrepreneurial sense, because there are such ebb and flows mm -hmm. like right. of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. So like I, I mean, I appreciate that. I'm just like, I'm thinking of like all the other stuff and people I've read and like successes and seen how some people have stuck it out. I, I think, yeah, you're right. I think that's a two pronged approach. Some people. Well, I think it's different coming from our perspective because we started a business versus like, we're just jumping into an industry and having a job. Right. Right. And so when you're the employee, mm. um, that's, that answer is going to sound different than someone who has like started something from the ground up. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny, right. You know, again, right. Logan that we yeah. mutual know, right. I mean, he, he started off in the medical side, mm -hmm. then sort of like working at a, like a doctor's office and then branched off to doing something half, you know, with his EMG, the neuro mm -hmm. testing, and then went into like Airbnb. Now he's doing Christmas mm -hmm. lights and some other stuff that is like not even remotely close. Yeah. Pharma into yep. being a realtor. 
Listen, and now broker. <laughs> we talk about this all the time. And my financial advisor is like, dude, you're a little too heavy invested in real estate. You know, he's always trying to get us to diversify. We've talked about this, you know, like we have several different revenue streams, but it's mostly all related to real estate. And, um, you know, our financial advisor is trying to get us that. We've, we, you know, we're, we are entrepreneurial, so we're always thinking of what could we do that might not be related to real estate. And, yeah. you know, if you got any ideas, let us know. But He's like, portfolio, where's your portfolio? It's right <laughs> here. We need it to be right here. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of people. I, it's a very, yeah, that's always very interesting. I was always like, I'm like, hey, quantum's the next big thing. What do you put your money into the material that's going to be, well, it's gold. And I'm like, oh, well, never mind. That's, yeah. That's like yeah. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, I'll ask that one out. But anyways, yeah. okay. <laughs> so cool. Okay. So you added property management in 2009. So your hiring process is very organic and people, you know, which, uh, again, a lot of, even the business I, I work for, right. Same boat, right. Like knowing people is a big mm-hmm. deal because yes. I always, I'm a big believer Proximity in like principle. Th- there you go. Right. Or like, Hey, if you have, especially in your career, the soft skills, right. Hard to teach, mm-hmm. but hard, hard skills, if you will, technical, like, okay, we can teach you those, mm-hmm. but like the other way around is very, very difficult to do. So that right. I can completely appreciate that. So from the, the property management standpoint, you stood up your business. Um, I, I really, man, I'm very curious about the, the 2008 side of the house, right. Cause of, of what happened there, but right. <laughs> more importantly, um, so like during this time frame, right. When I can't, so math, like public math. So when w- kids got involved at what year here? Like you said. 2011. T- yeah. 2011. Okay. So this was post the, the 2008, but okay. So, so how, how did you deal with or work through that, that period of time when the, the market just was, I know you said the property management side helped and come in, but like that was such I a. I was doing the property management at that time. She was still in pharma until 2013. Yes. Um, oh, I didn't know that. So yeah. she kept, she maintained an active, voluntary inactive. So she would get the training every two years that were required to get as realtors. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, she was still working in pharma until um, we were pregnant with baby number two and her company got bought out. Uh-huh. So she was going to, again, be in that transition. And she knew that she always wanted to work for the business, number one. Number two, when we started having multiple kids, it made it more difficult to work at the same time. She right. wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Oh, that's so, cool. um, so she did not go back into pharma after we had baby number two. Um, and then after that, basically, she um, involved herself in the business um, as our kids aged um, with their schooling timeline. So uh, when our kids were half day, she would work half day with us. When our kids were full day, you know, ba- basically it just transitioned through the age of the kids and, and how long they were in school. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see a noticeable spike in our business, especially in property management, when she came to work full time for Sound Choice. So, um, you know, I, I mean, was like, let me hit the applause button. <laughs> that's right, there you go. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's incredible. We we had um, been at like the 100 property level for probably almost a decade. It's like we would sell 10 or 15 in a year, and then we would pick up 10 or 15, but we had plateaued. When she came on board, it's been all up. Um, we still sell several, you know, of the rentals we manage occasionally. You know, mm-hmm. people's uh, desires and, and goals change, and we sell them, but we are picking them up faster than we can sell them. You know uh, what I'm saying? So, yeah. So the numbers, we're at 300 plus now. Holy cow. Um, so we went from 100 to 300, probably in... A year and a half. Wow. No, Gosh. not that quick. I, think I, I would say it was probably maybe three to five years, but uh, still no, no, no. very quick. No, that's not Very right, quickly. I can Fact check. Let me Google. Fact check. Let me, Google. Fact check. <laughs> no, we well, let me know if on you that. can find that information. <laughs> yeah, we went quick on that. <laughs> You're surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, that was uh, um, definitely a... Uh, a big uh, shot in the arm when when she came to work full time. So she came from corporate world. Right. I've always been self employed. Yep. Um, and um, so she just you know kind of the gaps we're talking about. I mean she has experience. When she was the manager, you know she was hiring and firing. Mm-hmm. I, I always made her do the the hiring and the firing mm. until recently. Yeah. Um, so did did her did her income help supplement the two thousand eight situation oh, for yeah. that period of time? Is that what, yeah. like, what we decided at that time um, was we were going to always live. W- this sounds funny, but we were going to um, live. This is going to sound very patriarchal, Wait a but minute. that's not how this was. No, no, no. Okay. Actually, her money. No, this is what it was. We were going to live off of my income, not yeah. count on her having a job. 
Yes. Um, so her money, actually, her money, it's our money. <laughs> the money she was earning from the yep. job um, that, that she had, we actually used for investment. So, you know, the very first rental property we bought was in 2011, and it was like $58,000 nice. in Valparaiso. I yes. mean, you know, I mean, it was crazy. We got a loan. You can't buy a car for that today. No, I mean, it's ridiculous. No, you can't. No. No, you can't. Um, Not one that's going to get you to, you know. School and back. Two blocks. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Two blocks. <laughs> but um, so that's how we decided to budget because we knew that she wasn't gonna gonna be working forever. That was our goal, um, at least when we started having kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we kind of just used hers as like the fun money. You know what I'm saying? Or right. the investment, or or building into the future. And and we've tried to carry that principle through even uh, you know to this day where we wow. we budget off of the gear and quote, the guaranteed income, which yeah. is more the property management. Sales are never guaranteed. Yeah. Sales have been great, right? but they're never guaranteed. So we've yeah. never really budgeted off of the sales income, but more off of the property management, which is more consistent. Right. Yeah, that's cool. I, I just, I, I can only imagine, right? Because that's when I, like, I think when we're, we were moving, when did we move out of Vegas in 2009? And we had so many friends in Vegas and they were losing like yeah. Yeah. two to $300,000 yeah. yeah, so, on their yeah, houses. Awful. And I'm like, Holy cow, right? So, I mean, you're, they're still buying and selling, but also, I mean, this was the time where, especially in Vegas, they were like trashing houses. People were yeah. so mad they would leave and they're, I mean, they're costing tens of thousands yeah. of dollars in damage, like leaving because they're getting kicked out of houses. Yeah. Or people then started squatting in houses and all that craziness. So it's always curious, I'm always curious, right, from like this perspective here, because we weren't here yet, like, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> like how that, that worked. So, because I mean, again, that it's, you're still buying and selling, but it's, it's like the volatility and like, just, I mean, they were doing short sales back then. Um, oh, that's right. Short sales then are kind of like the assumptions today. Um, in terms of timelines, they would take three to six months minimum, um, from contract to closing. And there was a lot of, uh, correspondence with the bank. Assumptions are the new hot topic today. You know, everybody wants to get that interest rate that was, you know, sub 3% or somewhere between three and three and a half percent. And, um, and you know, they should take two to three months. They're now taking four to six months for those Mm. to be approved because it's, it's, it's just a long process. And honestly, there's not a lot of motivation from the banks because they literally only get paid a $300 loan assumption fee, the bank (laughs) and the buyer reaps the benefit. Wow. It's incredible. The assumptions, if you're patient, are are great. And also, if there's not a huge gap, because you have to pay the difference between loan amount and contract price, right. new value. Yep. So there's usually, I mean, I've done one as little as probably forty or $50,000 that they had to bring to the table. I've done some that are as much as $300,000 wow. that they have to bring to the table. So. Wow. Because of the price difference. Exactly. Wow. Yep. Yeah. That's super interesting. So <laughs> so I guess, so I never asked, and I thought this was very curious, by the way, so is my pause. Like everyone has a pause. Basically, they say something. I've noticed when I've listened back, I always say so. So for the listener, sorry, I do say that. Oh. But I've, I completely am self-aware and recognize that. <laughs> How did you come up with the name Sound Choice? <laughs> Man, that is interesting. It's actually funny. A good buddy of mine, uh, Richie, um, and I apparently he was joking when he suggested that I name my company that. And apparently I didn't get the memo. You know? so <laughs> we named it and I'm telling him this, you know, months later. And he's like, you actually called your business that? <laughs> you can't change three years in or whatever. You know, you got to stick uh, with it. Yeah. So no rhyme or reason. I, I, I mean... I, I don't know. It, it, it just came about. You were spitballing and that I one was, just. I was single back then. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have, you know, my better half to, to give me some wisdom, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but hey, you know, looking back, I'm like, I, I like it. A sound choice. You yeah. Know? No, that's so, what uh, that's what I thought. Right. Like it's yeah, a sure. the trust, the personal relationship. This is a sound choice. Absolutely. Right. That mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. So, hey, good. I'm a musical guy. I grew up playing the piano. And so there was some of that plus the sound, you know, the intercoastal waterway. There was a uh, little bit of nuance to this. Okay. It wasn't completely unthought of, but wordplay um, is great. Yeah, <laughs> I love the wordplay on that. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's cool that you've kept it. Like, cause yeah. you know, a lot of people they uh, they rebrand over time and they go through whatever kind of changes or like whether that's from a marketing standpoint, either like visual imaging or like again they just change the whatever. We did font. change the, the logo. Look. The, the logo. initial logo was very cheesy. I would say. Um, and actually, my sister-in-law helped us design oh. the uh, the most recent uh, iteration, which was probably ten years ago, you know. But a little bit more elegant, I would say. Yeah, um, classy. Classy. Yeah, getting away from the college, like joking, yeah. don't even know yeah. type. <laughs> sure, sounds good. Wait, that was a joke? Yeah, cool. We're gonna stick with it. Yeah, I love that. 
That's a great story. I love that part. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so you have, have the business established. Wait, I, I don't think we talked about when you, when did you actually get the, uh, office space and merchants walk? What year was that? 14. Mm. Yeah. 15. I think it might've been around 2014. Yeah. 14 or 15. So, so for people that want to get in the real estate business as a sales associate, right? The steps would be like, Hey, you know, study, get your licensing, potentially go, I mean, well, you said two years in Florida, you have to go work for a brokerage, bro mm -hmm. brokerage. Yes, Why you have to hang your license great. under a brokerage. Oh, under a brokerage. And then you'd have to study and test to become a broker. And then I'm assuming there's a fee you'd have to pay the state mm -hmm. yeah. to stand that up. Then you're going to have to pay the fee, the LLC, if you want to mm -hmm. choose to do that, get the name, all the legalities that go behind that kind of stuff. Insurance. Insurance. Oh, errors yeah. and emissions insurance. We have a spreadsheet for all the insurance. Yeah, there's a lot of overhead to pay. It's crazy. It's not just you open shop. There's a lot of overhead and insurance products that you need, and um, it's yeah, things that people don't always think about. But yeah. I, I mean, at the end of the day, we're entrepreneurs, so you know we accept that risk. Sure. Well, but it's 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 always interesting because people like they'll, they'll see something and they're like, Oh, that's, that's awesome. And then they don't like, I was uh, either pull the thread or, or peel back the onion are my two go-tos there. Right. Okay. So it's like, okay, but to get established, like, you know, again, people like want to jump into it. They're like, Oh, I see these people on TV and they're selling, you know, orange County or they're selling like New yeah. York or whatever. And they're glitz and glam and these multi dollar, you know, multi-million dollar houses or mansions or condos and like I could do that. And you know, I can look good in a suit or what you right? Like yeah, all but these then things. You but also read like, okay, they, they just filed for bankruptcy last week, right? So we read that too. Yep. So, I mean, there's, I think you, when you peel back the onion, as you said, like there's, okay, business budgeting is important. You can't just say, I'm going to do this and move forward and spend a lot of money in overhead and then just Don't open up shop and I'm going to sell all this business and, you know, all the taxes. I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of overhead and there's definitely somebody to think about, I think in any business that you're opening, you have to have a realistic picture. Okay, even just stepping back, if you're just your real estate, your realtor, your real estate agent, and you're working under a brokerage, you're going to have overhead too. And I think people jump into real estate thinking, oh, this is kind of a side gig, right? I can do this on the side. I can make a little bit of money. And when the market's good, yeah, sure, you can. You can, but you can, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you really want to be good at real estate, it's a full time and then some job. In fact, we were at a dinner with uh, like a, a dinner, a couple's dinner with the local real estate agents, and we were joking what the spouses of the real estate agents were there and i don't you know i don't sell full time so i'm the spouse and we were saying how we were going to start a support group for spouses of real estate agents <laughs> <laughs> because we get it we get that you know the phone rings on christmas day we get it that there's no set working hours and work life balance from a traditional standpoint is a farce that's right. not it's not possible. And I think you need to recognize that walking into this industry. It's not possible because if that were possible, it's not fair to your clients. Yeah. And so you need to be available. You need to be able to flex. You need to, um, you know, drive two cars everywhere in case Andrew has to leave and show property really fast. You know, right. so it is, you do have to flex. You do have to be available. Being available is really, really important in our industry. People mm -hmm. need that. Um, again, we talked about this is an important asset that we're talking about. So right. People, um, people want to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah. Um, as far as that's concerned, like I see this from the real estate perspective where, yes, I have flexibility, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, I do need to be available because that's my paycheck is, is contingent upon that. So I'll just give you a, a, an example. You know, I had a client that I talked to yesterday, um, and they want to come into town tomorrow morning and see property. And I'm like, I, my Saturday is already planned. Like I, I can't do this. So I have a decision to make. I either have to, you know, shuffle things around to make this happen. And the, the challenging thing is this is a referral from a past client. Oh, right. So, um, but a anyways, it's just one of those examples where um, I, I'm going to shift because I don't like to refer my referrals to one of my associates. Yeah. Usually whenever I'm, uh, um, one of the things that I do as a broker is when I get a lead Sometimes I'll try to secure that lead, um, uh, have the initial conversation, get them comfortable with who we are as a business, but then I'm going to refer them to one of my experts, maybe one of my buyer specialists or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and so that's kind of how I've helped them, um, you know, build the business, their business and everything. And and the way that real estate kind of works is it's, a, um, it's cyclical. So usually we're selling a house to to a family today and one of two things is going to happen one they're going to outgrow it like you guys did mm -hmm. and 
you know, you're going to want to sell that house and buy something bigger mm -hmm. or two, you want to downsize or move out of the area or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a relational based thing. And the, and the highest compliment that I can have as a realtor is to have repeat business mm -hmm. and to have referrals. And so I always try to take care of those referrals, but the problem is it's just, I'm one person. All right. So the reality is setting expectations. Mm -hmm. So the conversation that I might have have to have with these people, because I forgot that we had family arriving tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon, you know, when I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be finished with this one thing by mid morning and then I can help you. Right. Um, I'm like, oh, shoot. No, they're arriving at the airport early afternoon, you know, oh, so no. I've got a very small window of time. Yep. Set that expectation. Don't be like, yes, I can do it. And then don't do it. Right. So that's one thing I've learned over the years is is a lot of times I have the best intentions and I overcommit and under deliver. I'm trying, you know, that's one of the biggest things that I try to avoid these days is if I can set the expectation up front to where they know what's coming, it makes for a lot smoother experience. Yeah. So one of the, the nuggets that you told me earlier as a lessons learned is like, don't forget how and when to do taxes as you become a sales associate and then a, a broker as well, right? Like there's some some nuances that you, that you have to be aware of. You've talked about the overhead and flexibility and being sure, but there's also the financial side. So there's the overhead, overhead financial side, but there's also the taxes portion of yes. making sure that you do that correctly. Yeah. My first year in the business, I did not um, incorporate properly. And so I learned, you know, Hey, when you're employed by somebody, you contribute half of it and your employer contributes half. Well, when you're self-employed and you're not, you don't file the right way, you have to pay that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So my first year in real estate, um, I had to pay a lot more taxes than I should have. Um, you know, just the, the typical social security and Medicare tax that everybody mm -hmm. has to pay when you work for somebody else, you know? So that next year I incorporated as a PA, um, at that time, not an LLC or anything, but mm -hmm. it, it enabled me to be able to write certain things off, not have to pay self-employment tax on every penny that the business brought in. Right. Um, you know, so that was uh, an important lesson learned. So now when like an agent comes in, I can, of course, pass that along to them. They're like, hey, you know, how should I set up? You know, I'm self-employed, right? And I'm yeah. like, yes, but go set up a business. Right. Really. You know, it might just be your name, comma, LLC. Yeah. You know, that's what a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Um, but it just en enables you to kind of do the business owner things where you can write off stuff that just normal people that don't own a business can't write off their cell phone bill, right. you know, but us as business owners, we write off that cell phone. Sure. Um, you know, amongst other things, right. but, um, yeah, that was a important Legally, early legal things. That's right. Absolutely. Clarify that. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's huge. Right. Like, I mean, we, there's, there's a guy we used to go to in Vegas and it was like, cause they have military you shavers. Like, I mean, there's all this stuff, haircuts, all these things. Yeah. Right. And then you're like, okay. And like, is this legit? Yes, it's legit. Right. You pull mm -hmm. up the itemized list. And again, like we transitioned out now it's like, okay, we go to somebody else and they've helped out and like recognize this. Right. And you know, the people have that experience, right. Getting, getting that solidified. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's a huge lesson learned. So I appreciate that. So I, I, I think now, like we've, we've talked about, right. Your history, how y'all met business partnership relationships, how vital that is. The relationships with your with your clients um and then going forward right so to the the one thing i really want to hit on real quick is so how how do you go about from a personal and or marketing standpoint to get clients so you said a lot about the referral side of the house mm -hmm. so what other avenues do you utilize to to get clients um it's it kind of transitions and i think that this is part of building a business um so Probably when when did you buy your first house with me? Do you remember? <laughs> you were living in a camper, I think, when when we met. Hey, hey it, was a, <laughs> it, it was a fifth wheel. Let's use some. It was a fifth wheel. It was a camper. It was a fifth wheel. Yes, that is correct. I yes. joke. We I were joke. in a fifth wheel for three and a half years. Yeah, um, it was a big one, though, forty-three and a half foot long. Okay. So yes, but yeah, so that was the I'm Zillow jealous. aspect. Yeah, no, it was awesome. But we're we're here now. This yeah. is awesome. So yes. <laughs> So yeah, so I think it was like 2015. Oh no, because we got here in 14, and there was a year oh, so or two. 17 or 18. I think that's right. So I think I had been advertising. I don't remember. I was trying to timeline when I started advertising with Zillow, but um, I started with just a very small investment, um, a couple hundred bucks, maybe maybe two to five hundred. I don't remember exactly, but I remember um, the first couple of clients that I secured from that marketing, and it's just a snowball effect. So the way that real estate is, like we were saying earlier, it's just, it's cyclical. So 
the more people that I'm serving, that I'm assisting, mm-hmm. they know people and they're talking. If you do a good job, they're going to talk about you. And that's mm-hmm. our goal, obviously. But we've supplemented building that business by advertising with Zillow. And, and our spend on Zillow got to be quite substantial. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a way that I brought in leads for my new agents and I could send them leads from Zillow or Trulia or Realtor.com, you know, various uh, a consumer basically facing portals. Mm-hmm. Um um, and obviously that business has ebbed and flowed a little bit, but ultimately when you have a bigger base of clients, those that's more people that can refer you to somebody else. And so now I would say I could eliminate all of that advertising. I still keep it a little bit just mm-hmm. to have my I name see it out on there. Yeah. Facebook often. Really? Yes. Great. Um, I, that's interesting because, um, I'm debating whether or not to continue that. So we I, may have to discuss later. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we've, we've, we've tried different avenues and, and a lot of that is just so that our name is still top of mind, but ultimately the best business, uh, acquisition for us is past clients. Mm -hmm. Um, and that means the most to us as well. Honestly, I don't have to work as hard. If you told your buddy, Hey, you need to contact Andrew or you need to contact sound choice real estate because they're awesome. Mm -hmm. That buddy's going to use us most likely. Yep. I'm not having to sell us you know, um, and that's just not like anecdotal evidence. Like there's statistics, like you can read in real estate publications that like that is, that's your biggest referral source across the board by far statistically for all real estate agents. It's going to be word of mouth advertising. It's going to be your, you do a good job for somebody and they refer you to somebody else. Hands down. Wow. That's it's man. You wouldn't believe how many times I've heard word of mouth, like mm-hmm. from all the entrepreneurs yeah. here. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's, I'm gonna say absurd, but in a positive way. Absurd. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like how much, because everyone's pushing like digital marketing, digital that's marketing, right. do yeah. this. And you're like, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know if it's like the town size or, or like you said, I mean, and that's, I the, would say that's more supplemental because you're yeah. seeing my stuff on social media. So right. that's intentional. That's brand recognition. Too. Right. And yeah. that's different. Brand recognition does not always equate to you getting clients True. in real estate. Yep. That's true. I will, I will also say a, a, another feeder into our sales side is the property management side of our business. So mm. realistically, there's going to be a percentage of those homeowners that we manage investments for that decide to sell mm-hmm. within a calendar year. And so those oh, wow. often stay Not in a house. calendar year of us acquiring them right. as a client per yeah. se. Right. But, but every year there's going to be right. a chunk I of those that we're, that. that we're also selling for these, for these clients as well. I say that, but I also say we do just because I do want to make this clear in case someone hears us talking about this, that we act, we other real estate agents in our community, most real estate agents do not want to do property management. It is a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so they will refer clients for property management to us and we protect them as their clients. So we don't, we make sure that in our software, there's like a bolded tagline that so no none of our employees are engaging in a conversation about selling and if they do we say would you, let's why don't we go ahead and contact your you know agent. your agent right. and this We're is the person steal business from right others. so we will protect that because we do treat these sides of the business as very very separate yep. but inevitably our clients we're going to be managing some investment you know some of their investment portfolio and then as a result when they sell they will use us and so I had a client reach out to me this week that I sold him a home probably four or five years ago, military guy. We managed his house in Blue Water Bay. He reached out to me. He's in Alaska now. Reached out to me this week, and he says, hey, we're coming back to Herbert. Uh, We want you to help us buy another home. Um, So we're looking in a variety of spots, but this is just kind of the the cycle of real estate. And this is what I love. Now that I've been in the industry for over 20 years, it's like you're getting to see everything come full circle. And uh, it's it's really um, encouraging because it's like people worry with the real estate market um, Mm -hmm. shifting. I mean, really, we started to see another shift um, in real estate in August of 2022. That was when uh, interest rates started to rise. Mm -hmm. So these historically low rates of two and a half to three and a half or sub four percent had been around for probably almost 15 years. Um, And. once that happened, and with the skyrocketing in prices, you know, people are like, how are, how's anybody going to afford a home? Right. I mean, the median priced home, if you're getting a VA 100% financing on the median priced home in Niceville, it's going to cost you about thirty-five dollars or $3,600 a month if you're not making a down payment. Um, that's taxes, insurance, principal, and interest. Right now, interest rates are hovering around 7 or higher. Mm-hmm. Um, what she was saying, she went to a uh, NAR... Um, a briefing last Friday and, and basically um, 
Uh, what what was it? The so yeah, they there was an economic advisor, I guess, some Harvard trained economic economist that works for NAR. Yep. <laughs> okay, so he um, came well, and, he <laughs> yeah. came and spoke at um, Lawrence Yoon. At yeah, it was great. You've t- probably seen him if you've watched anything. Yeah, it was really good. I enjoy reading. So I'm, I'm a big nerd. Like I do read a lot. I read a lot of publications and I read the real estate magazines that come in the mail. Andrew does not. So I give him I, cliff that's notes, not you know, true. and um, <laughs> not to- not so I, I always enjoy reading his articles, but I went to see him in person last Friday and he said basically in a nutshell, 6% is the new 2%, right? Let's mm. so let's not expect yep. that things are going to dip and people are waiting and trying to time the market. I think Andrew has something he wants to talk about this, this idea of timing the market. Um, so I'll let him talk about that, but 6% is the new 2%. Yeah. And, and what happened That's where we're is gonna be for a minute. you like to talk about COVID I know on your uh, stuff. So maybe I'll just dovetail into <laughs> that, but yeah. basically in COVID, uh, you know, rates were still low. Demand was through the roof. Mm-hmm. Okay. L- inventory was, terribly limited so economic principle when supply is low and demand is high prices go up right and they went up up, yes Mm -hmm. Yes. and so the challenge is when interest rates started rising the expectation was prices are going to have to come down right nobody can afford it right the reality is we've been waiting for that since august of 2022 and it hadn't happened you've seen a little bit of softening Mm. okay and you can look at specific one-offs and say, okay, the values have decreased a little bit here, a little bit there, but generally speaking, the values are at a steady pace up still with high interest rates and really high prices. And the reason for that, in my opinion, um, is because you still have um, a good amount of demand. It's not quite as high as it was through the COVID years, Mm -hmm. but um, a good amount of demand and still relatively low supply the difference between what we're experiencing right now and what we experienced when the market shifted in the 2000 well really 2007 and 8 the real estate market plateaued 2009 is when it started to go down the reason why things went down is because inventory was very high Mm -hmm. and demand went down there was too much inventory Mm -hmm. i mean this is why you see half-built developments Um, that's why prices went down then the reason why experts are saying prices may not go down now is because we still have reasonable demand and we have very limited supply. Mm. It's always interesting because, you know, listening to the Elon book and others, one of the greatest fears is depopulation. And so I wrote a a paper on like different generations and looking at the population ebb and flow. And we're actually like, there was the baby boomers. And then pretty much ever since then, it's been, you know, slowly going down, even though I think it was like after the millennial, the generation X or whatever, like, you know, the population went up a little bit, never, Compared to that. So it's interesting to hear about the supply and demand and the new houses coming out, especially with the fear of depopulation and humanity not producing enough. So it's like, huh, I wonder where the supply is coming from. Like if we don't have enough people in the first place and maybe because people also living longer and staying in those houses. So then you have this new population coming where I, it'll be interesting too, because the baby boomers are at that retirement and unfortunately right. passing away stage. Mm-hmm. So that'll be interesting to see that drop. Like yep. when they all pass away and those houses become available to see that as a trend because now that supply will substantially increase. Correct. And so now you have these older houses where people are like, okay, those prices will have to go down because all the renovation that's going to go up because all these brand new builds that are like more attractive, right. To people to go purchase. So, and we all know real estate is local, right? So everyone says that that's a, that's a conversation that real estate is real estate is local. So it's very specific to our local area. So Mm -hmm. how we are, different here. So in, let's say in Niceville, Mm -hmm. um, is that we are sort of landlocked, right? There's no, there's not a lot of building that can continue to happen in perpetuity. And so, um, this economist is also talking about like places like Austin and New York and Philadelphia and how, um, the apartment rental community. So they built all these big apartments, build apartments, trying to catch up demand, catch up demand. And now we have, um, a higher level of vacancy rates in apartments and apartment leasing pricing is having to go down. We are not seeing that here. We're not seeing that here because we have a lot of people, um, thanks to the Air Force, so, you know, the military is moving. People are moving here. People are moving here because it's Florida and people are moving here because they didn't want to wear a mask. People are moving here for all kinds of reasons. Right. Or be- I think COVID, <coughs> and we heard this from people moving to our area because 
they, and they would say, no one ever told us we could live wherever we wanted to live. And now we realize we can, and we want to live here. Wow. So yeah. people are moving here. This is a yeah. great place to live. We love living yeah. here. I'm sure you do too. So, yeah. <laughs> I do. so far. Yeah, Absolutely. so far. So, <laughs> been almost um, a decade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that we are a little bit different. We're not seeing vacancy rates here. Yeah. Right. So it's bigger slowed. cities, you're going to see it a little bit. It is slowed, but that's normal. Well, it's funny. I was going to ask that <clears throat> because you do see that, right? Like, and there was the whole influx. Act X flux outflux of like inner city living. Right. Yeah. And then it was like suburbs Get out of the and city. There's some word to it's not urbanite. There's, there's another word where it's like the urban side has become the new thing. Mm -hmm. And then now people are starting to move back in gentrification. That's it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So <laughs> we're so many words, a little time. So like now people are moving back into the inner city, sort of like you're talking about not, no, not, not like exclusively and you know, depending on yeah. what city, like you just said, but it's, it's interesting. Cause it's again, that ebb and flow of like going to the city, do stuff. Nope move out to the, the suburbs, mm -hmm. nope, move closer back in. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's crazy. And then, yeah, like you said, if there's, there's no more, where do you go up, down, like, you're right. Like that's, there's no more property to, to, to build on. That's an example of something that I think, um, if you can ask for lessons that, that I've learned in my career, um, like I got into real estate when the market was white hot, you know, 2003, 2004, really. I was selling pre-construction condos while I was studying for exams, you know what I'm saying? But these condos never came to fruition, or at least not in the time frame that I was expecting. So by the time 2006 rolls around and you're starting to see a shift in the real estate market, those buildings never got built. Wow. And so people would fall out of contract, all these pre-sales that I had uh you know, facilitated, it just never came to fruition. Um, you know, I, the, another lesson real quick, um, don't count your chickens before your commission before it's actually earned. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, you know, you'll, you'll talk to real estate agents and there's businesses out there built on this where they're literally prepay you your commission. That is not wise because you're not guaranteed that a deal is going to close. And so if you're counting on a commission before you've actually closed, could be in trouble. Mm. But, um, uh, I would say that one of the lessons that I learned from, um, from the real estate, you know, boom and then bust, um, from early in my career is I bought a lot of vacant land. Guess what you can't do with vacant land unless you develop it. I shouldn't say you can't, but it's hard to generate income with vacant land. You could, you know, if you have a home that you can rent and maybe you're underwater, like she said earlier, you can rent it and cover most of your expenses and maybe you have to bring a little to the table and that's doable for a certain period of time to mm -hmm. kind of ride out the the shift. Okay. But we say, look, you do not buy a piece of property with the expectation of things continuing the way they've always continued. If you're right. expecting when you buy that, Hey, I can't afford it today, but a year from now I'll be fine because it'll have gone up 20% uh, in value or, yeah. or rates are going to rise or, you know, in terms of uh, rental rates or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the way that you're producing income to pay your expenses, you cannot count on that. If that's what you're counting on to buy something, then we say run away, mm -hmm. don't do it. Um, but you know, with transitions, sometimes you have to shift and you have to do things that you didn't expect to when you first got in. So for instance, if you're military and you didn't realize you were going to get orders two years after you bought that home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're starting to see this a little bit where people can't sell their house, they can't pay it off, or they're having to bring money to the table. We're seeing that again. Mm -hmm. um, I had a closing a few weeks ago where the seller, I was on the buyer side, but the seller had to bring $20,000 to the table. And this was a $300,000 house. It wasn't, wow. a, it wasn't a high end home, you know? Wow. Um, that's so a lot that's, in that. That's They had to sell in less than a year from when they bought it. So we tell people, look, buying is not always your best option. Yeah. Look, I'd love to sell anybody a house. Mm -hmm. But the reality is I'm going to give you good advice based upon my experience mm -hmm. and my knowledge. Yeah. No, that's crazy. And then we're also seeing on the rental side that I, I have taken a lot of calls recently where where individuals have purchased a home, you know, 100% financing and then have to leave. They also can't rent it to cover their mortgage either. And so Whoa. that it's not happening at, on mass, but it is yeah. happening that's scary. So, so, yeah. so I want to ask the question. So we're going to talk about professional and personal life learned here in about two, two subjects, if mm -hmm. you will. So I really like this transition to how we're going. Um, I want to do, cause it's all about the top five, top five. <laughs> okay. So from each of you, because you have your own different perspectives, give me the top five. Cause I think maybe we'll do property management slash rental and then we'll do owner buyer. Okay. What are the top five things people should know as a buyer and seller, Andrew, I'll tell you that, 
And then Tiffany, what are the top five things people from a rental perspective should know? So like the owner, the prop, the investor, the right. So the, okay. as the person owning it, renting it, mm-hmm. and then the person coming to rent it. Okay. What should they ask for all this stuff? So we'll, Andrew, if you don't mind, we'll start with the buying and selling top five as a buyer Top five as a seller. What man, I might need to have some help to get to five. But okay, okay three. Um, Let's go three. Is three better say, for y'all? We um, can do three. On the buying side, and we've talked about this a lot. Um, I would say to keep an open mind um, because you know this isn't HGTV. Everybody thinks with the world of HGTV, <laughs> ship lap. I want ship that's right. ruined that's right. us. <laughs> and ruined you know, us. to be honest with you, I, one of my favorite. Um, transactions or, or whatever to help facilitate is one where it isn't that one that has just been joanna you know, Chip and joanna you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, because I like to see um, uh, a transformation, mm-hmm. which is probably why I bought the office building I bought, you know, like to, to kind of make something new out of something old, you know. Mm. But we tell people all the time, you know, um, if what you're looking for is not available in the market. We can probably do certain things to make it available. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, maybe it's the home that has great bones, but you've got to put a little bit of lipstick on it. I mean, sometimes mm-hmm. it's literally as simple as just paint and flooring, mm-hmm. which is very doable, but mm-hmm. it can be as much as, I mean, we've had people take out beams, open up walls, you know, I connect them with contractors yeah. and, and, uh, you know, do those sorts of things. And I love that kind of stuff because I love to see a transformation. But I think that a lot of buyers get um, just this tunnel vision where they can't see outside of this picture they have in their mind of the home that they want to move into. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that's one thing. Have an open mind. Um, kind of trust the process, tr- you know, which is why, look, there's thousands upon thousands of agents just in our little market. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is people have different experiences. People have different um uh, expertise. And, right. um, you know, while I would love to work with everybody that there is out there and I kind of always get, you know, frustrated if somebody chooses somebody else, the reality is there's a lot of good agents out mm-hmm. there. I, I'm not going to say that I'm the only one that can help you here. Right. Um, there's enough business to go around. And I would say that as my career has developed, I've kind of had to learn that the hard way because I would just get frustrated or not pick a fight, but you know, I, I would um, be principled on something. And instead of working it out in a, you know, kind of a level-headed way, they'd be like, I'd be this young guy that's got, you know, these ideas and just getting mad at this agent that's, you know, doing it a different <laughs> way. Well, you know what I mean. So I, I play better with others now later yeah. in my career than I did early in my career. But, um, um, you know, to have an open mind as a buyer, um, trust the process, um, to not uh, uh, overpay for something, mm. to be house poor, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, we're big budgeting people. And so I try to give I, I, my background is finance. You know, I, I like to help people with the financial side of things. I'm not just selling somebody a home. I'm selling them, you know, a, a lifestyle, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, um, and if you owe too much to the bank every month, it's going to create stress in your yep. relationships. Yep. You know, um, I don't know. What else would you say? No, I think that's good. Oh, I think you were going to, when that you and I three. talked about that this earlier, you had talked to me a little bit about timing the market. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Basically, so I am a Ramsey trusted uh, real estate advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, so Dave Ramsey's a, a financial guy. Um, probably seven or eight years ago, I uh, joined his team as, as a, a Ramsey trusted. And essentially, um, you know, I went through six months of six months of training uh, with them um, to kind of have, um, make sure we were aligned properly and everything like that. But ultimately what I'm, what a Ramsey trusted realtor does is they help guide people. Um, uh, His thing is you have the heart of a teacher um, uh, and guide people um, responsibly, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, their principles are you shouldn't uh, pay more than 25% of your um, take home pay uh, for financing, for, for, for housing. The reality is lenders will approve you for up to 40 to 50% of your mm. take home pay. And we say that those people are house poor. All right. Um, <clears throat> but, um, timing the market. So what Ramsey will say is, um, you know, when you're ready to buy a home, buy a home, don't say, is the market going to dip? Um, are the interest rates going to come down? You know, what's going to happen when interest rates come down? All these people that have been wanting to buy a home over the last several years, they're going to come back in the market. 
guess what they're going to be doing? Competing against you. Mm. So right now, it, it depends, and it's still, the market is a little bit funny. Some homes come on the market, and they're selling really quickly. Mm -hmm. Others are coming, and they're not selling quickly. Mm -hmm. You might get a concession from the seller. When have we seen that? Yeah. You know, it's been years since we've seen that. But if interest rates go down to below six, let's just say, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of people on the sidelines coming back in. The and that's going to, that's right. Yeah. And so you're going to have competition. So guess what's going to go away? All those concessions. Mm -hmm. So what, what we try to tell people is when you're ready, buy a home. Mm -hmm. Don't try to time the market. The perfect home is never going to be out there, really. Mm -hmm. That's why we say we can help make the perfect home for you. I, I have a vision for that. I can help people with that. Right. But um, the perfect time to buy a home is when you are financially prepared. So you've saved the money, you've got your down payment, you're, you've got an emergency fund, because guess what happens when you move into that house? The air conditioning goes out. If you don't have an emergency <laughs> fund, what are you going to do? Yep. Go borrow money to put in a freaking air conditioner? Right. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> have some money in the bank. The APR, and that's going to be at least yeah. double of what you just did for your house. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So that was for the the buyer, right? And I think that maybe that last one actually is probably for both buyer and seller. But yeah. do you have any top three for like the seller's perspective that they should know? I would say right now um, we are seeing a shift uh, where sellers, you know, several years ago could put anything on the market and it would sell. Mm -hmm. They weren't prepping the homes. They weren't even cleaning their homes, maybe. Um, and now we're actually having to do the hard work up front. So a lot of people that I'm um, listing for right now, we've been preparing since the end of last year. Oh, wow. So we would meet in November, December last year, and I would give them recommendations. Here's what I would recommend that you do. Yeah. We're not necessarily pricing their home then, but just all the things that are going to help your home sell the best. So right. curb appeal, uh, painting, um, you know, decluttering, whatever, yeah. whatever the list is for the sellers, um, Several years ago, they could list, you would have multiple offers and you would get exactly what you want, all mm -hmm. of your terms. You know, you could have your cake and eat it too, and right. you can't today. Yeah. Um, sellers are having to transition their expectations right now because they're looking at comps from, let's just say, six or 12 months ago. Right. They might not get those numbers. Right. They might, but they might not. Mm. And ultimately, we can look at, at you know, comparisons the exact same home that sold. I mean, I, I have an example from a home up in Crestview. It sold for uh, one price. We ended up selling for 10% less than that. It was still a massive gain for him, but it was 10% less than a recent comp wow. because the market had shifted. The Crestview market, you got a lot of new construction to yeah. compete with. Right. Um, and so that's just one example. I mean, still, and, and I think when, depending on the perspective, you know, people can spin this a, very, a, a way. They could say, oh my gosh, Values just declined 10%. The reality is that guy bought it for, let's just say, 250 grand three years ago, and he still sold for 300 grand. So mm -hmm. he was up, right? you know, he was up 20%, mm -hmm. um, you know, during a three-year period, which is great. But yeah. yes, the reality is he was down from, from the high point, right. you know. Um, so yeah, there's been a shift, and, and sellers are having to kind of manage expectations in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, every sale is different. You right. know, you have to look at their motivations. Um, some people are like, I don't want a thousand people coming through my home. So let's be aggressive on our pricing and get it sold in the first weekend. Wow. Um, we will provide advice and recommendations on how we think you can get there. How, how off, this is sort of a personal question. I'm curious. How off is the Zillow Zestimate? So people look at that, right? How, how off is that? Like 10, 15, 20%? Is it sometimes spot on? Sometimes they give you a range. I'm just curious what you've seen. I will tell you that every real estate agent looks at this estimate. You know why? Because you're looking at it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consumers are looking at it. It's yeah. a very consumer front facing uh, uh, you know, platform for people. So we use it as a reference point. I gotcha. But the reality is, I'm surprised that, you know, talking about AI, I've said this, I'm like, why can Zillow not use AI to figure out all the little manual adjustments that I'm making? Mm -hmm. Because I know a home. Mm -hmm. um, I know what it is inside. The picture should be able to tell you from AI, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Zillow hasn't figured that out yet. How interesting. Um, so they have a range. Sometimes the range is like a hundred grand. I <laughs> says, dude, who's, I, when I come in, my job is to be within about plus or minus 3%. Yeah. Like whenever I have an adjusted value that's within about 3%, that's awesome. Mm. Sometimes I'm not that close. I'm 10%, just like, you know, sometimes Zillow's 20%. But, yeah. you know, if 
So then we look and we try to hone in on what the actual value is, but that can be plus or minus a little bit. Zillow's close. It usually gets you in the ballpark and mm-hmm. then the the expert will come in. I'll come in and make the specific adjustments that we know that an appraiser is going to make. Right. I was just curious from a, like, again, a seller standpoint and mindset, right? Like you just said, like getting the house together and then like, is that something that they could resource and use or there's other stuff? So any, any other one or two that you have from a seller's perspective that they should know? When, se- when we work with sellers that um, are, let's just say they want to, to move homes, and especially if it's local, not just from here to maybe another base or something like that, um, those are often the most challenging transactions because they often cannot afford both properties. Um, so again, just management of expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're needing to sell one home to then qualify for the next home, um, it's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being realistic in, in your pricing, I mean, look, we could boil down real estate to as simple as if you're not priced right, your home is not going to sell. Yep. I could be the best salesperson in the world, but if I do not price your home right, it's not going to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think there obviously are benefits to having a great real estate agent versus, you know, the not so great ones, you know, <laughs> one being responsiveness. Mm-hmm. You know, which is why I hired an assistant a few years ago. You know, it's like I'm one person. I'm not answering my messages right now while we're here with you. You know, this could be a problem. Um, You know, that's, you know, so as you grow, as you expand, I'm only one person. I can't respond to a message real time. So we have an office. We have a phone. You know, we have an assistant. We have other people. We have a team. So behind Andrew, Andrew's the face, right? So, but behind that, there's a team of people that are doing things that you don't see. And that's important. One person cannot. I would say that as as a seller, you want to hire somebody that has a team. I agree. Yeah. Because one person can't do it all. Yeah. Get stretched too thin. You start losing the quality Mm -hmm. at that standpoint. That's one of my biggest fears. As we grow, as we expand, losing it's, we experience this on the vendor side of things. We get a great vendor and we're using them all the time. And guess what? Everybody else is using them too, because they're great. Right. Um, what do you do? That's a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why you have to hire the right people. Um, but hiring the right people is is hard work. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right. You know, in, investing into your employees, mm-hmm. investing into people around you, surrounding yourself with good people. Yep. Um, it's a culture thing, too. Do you know Rich Pruitt? Does that ring a bell? Yeah. He runs, yep. they, him and Alyssa own DS2, mm-hmm. uh, Dynamic Software Solutions. Yep. I was just talking to him two nights ago or whatever about the culture they've established in their company and because there's, you know, sometimes they even said people will come and like, hey, I got this, you know, price, whatever, like the salary that, you know, headhunters come out and they're both mm-hmm. like, we're staying around because we like the culture, right? Like right. that's a, that's a big deal. So sometimes it's like people, you know, there's money that, that can drive a lot of things, but the culture and like the established relationship that you can have with what the business is huge. So Tiffany, agree with that. What, what do you think the top three from a, hey, I, I'm thinking about renting my property and then the top three of like someone that wants to actually rent a property. Yeah, so I'll start with there's no <clears> such <throat> thing as passive income. So you hear the real estate, oh, passive income. There's no such thing as passive. You have to be involved. Even I mean, when think you about hire that. a property manager. Even when you hire a property manager, there's headspace. Like there's, you're gonna have to take that call because I can't, you know, we can't approve a $1,000 vendor to do a repair without your consent, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not just gonna spend your money without talking to you. So just know that there's some work involved. Mm-hmm. You can't just sit by and collect the check. Um, two, this is just some financial advice, but I will well, I will often take the call from someone who is considering renting out their property. So I'm moving in July. I'm considering hiring a property manager. Can you talk to me about what you do? And I'm often the one having those conversations. I like having those conversations. Mm-hmm. And one of the questions I will ask is, have you ever done this before? Have you, have you ever had a rental property? Um, if the answer is no, I dive in a lot further. And if they, if the answer is no, I will say, here's one really big piece of advice. Do not use this month's rental income mm. to pay for this month's mortgage. Month if ahead. you are in that position, you let's talk about selling instead, mm. because that you, you inevitably are going to have something just plan for that. I mm. say conservatively, if you have we, Andrew and I have rental property, right? So I will take away about three months of that and pretend that's not coming in because taxes, insurance, you know, HVAC, vacancy. overhead, vacancy, mm-hmm. whatever. So I'll say, let's just count on about nine months of that. That's very conservative, but that's the way I roll. So mm-hmm. 
And that's what I would tell somebody else to do. So consider you're only going to get about nine months of your rental income. Are you okay with that? And if you're good there, then great. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Three, uh, fix things, right? So just understand that there are real people doing, I mean, look, we're in your home, right? You got, I've got kids, you've got kids. I, we all got kids. We all, <laughs> we all got kids. Kids are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's pets, there's, you know, real people are doing real life mm-hmm. in your home. Mm-hmm. So understand that. And I use this example. I've been in my home for nine years, nine years. And we bought a home in foreclosure because that's what we do. And we gutted it <laughs> and we fixed it up. And we have a lot of sweat equity, sweat equity in that home. Mm-hmm. And it was beautiful when we moved in, right? Well, it's not still not quite. It's still beautiful. It's but ready for a repeat. Nine oh. years later, I don't notice all the things, right? Because <laughs> I've been living there. That's my dirt. Those are yep. my kids. Those are right. my, you know, Nicks and the baseboards from the hoverboard that, that not mine, <laughs> my, my kid, not my hoverboard, my kid's yeah. hoverboard. Um, I don't notice that really, but if you're a homeowner and you step away for nine years and you came back and you saw that, you'd be like, oh, you know, so just recognize, you know, you right. do have to um, financially be ready to like put some money back into the home. Yeah. Right? I would so say, understand but also that. recognize that, you know, we get this sometimes from, from the owner's perspective, like you're not managing our property well. And I'm like, look, the reality is when you lived in that home, you had some nicks and dings as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the You'd expectation the changes all of a sudden when they have a renter and they think that, that, that the home should be left in pristine, perfect condition. I'm like, you didn't leave it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, so having that perspective of recognizing that, you know, like she's saying, these are real people right. with real needs. And a lot of times people are just looking at the bottom line, like how much money am I making or not making? Yeah. And they, allow maintenance to be deferred or what's or a, whatever. what's a percentage you would say for somebody that wants to have a rental property that they should have a side for the annual fixing like or the expectation of someone moves out a year or two or three to come in to make sure like maybe new baseboards maybe new paint maybe new rugs or carpet or whatever like what's do y'all know is that like when a, we do a spreadsheet i usually do a minimum of five percent okay. um expectation for deferred maintenance is or, that, or is maintenance. that like five percent of the monthly per, rent or yeah. okay so it to be conservative um, or more aggressive, you could do 10%. But, mm. you know, a lot of times when you're doing these spreadsheets, I've got a spreadsheet I can send you to evaluate whether or not a, a investment is a good investment. Mm-hmm. And the reality is whenever I filled out these, uh, these spreadsheets over the last probably, even when rates were low, mm-hmm. um, when I have filled these out, the cash flow is very nominal, if, if cash flowing at all. You have to either make a substantial down payment Okay, especially, okay, one of the benefits that we have here um, uh, in a military community is you can come buy a primary residence as a military member with a VA loan, mm-hmm. 100% financing, and back three years ago, you could get rates that were still around 4%. Mm-hmm. Those properties are cash flowing, okay? People, fast forward a year from then, or two years, you know, anytime in the last, you know, two years or so, Interest rates are higher, which means your payment are higher. You could still get a 100% VA financing, which a traditional investment loan, you have to make a minimum of a 25% down payment. Mm -hmm. Um, When they're looking at their cash on cash return, they're like, this is ridiculous. I could make more money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. We sold several of our rental properties over the last two years because we realized the value was so high Mm -hmm. and the expenses were so high that we were like, you know what, let's sell let's cash out let's see what happens with the real estate market let's yeah. reinvest elsewhere yeah um and i've got a spreadsheet you know and we usually do the five to seven percent for the maintenance mm-hmm. to answer your question okay yeah no i appreciate that i think that's huge that was, that was things one of the... people don't think about well it, it was funny mm-hmm. the, the one thing i want to do before we transition we're getting close to wrapping up here is um i know like i contact you often <laughs> for recommendations of people that you have established a relationship yeah. over time for like handyman or painting or sprinklers or whatever. How, how did you go about building those relationships over time? And how is important, how important is that for real realtors and brokerage um, personnel going forward? That I, I'll, I'll, can I, I'll yeah. talk. Um, that is very important. That is a huge part of our, vi- mm-hmm. our business is the vendors that we hire. Um, and I will get asked on the property management side, do you have a, and keep in mind, we kind of protect our vendors. Mm. So like there's vendors that we just love and do a good job and I don't want to give their name to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. 
but you know that that's <laughs> but she was whispering andrew <laughs> i don't want to tell everyone who they are like yeah. last i'll be honest last week i had someone ask me if for a good handyman vendor and i gave him my number two i'm not going to give him my number one you mm. know so we, we, we protect, protect our vendors to a yeah. certain degree we'll give them to you yeah like our favorite client you get my, you get my top oh, i'm like oh i'm getting number two the whole no, time like, <laughs> you don't you don't get number two um but I always the say, list is okay, fluid, I have, though. yes, I have, we have a list of vendors, but I don't, it's not typed out. I can tell you that list changes all the time mm. because businesses grow, their business grows. They can't mm. meet the needs of our they business anymore. The, uh, their the prices go up. Mm. And that is one thing that we do. I think, well, um, vendor prices are going up, up, up and up. Their yep. overheads going up, up, up and up. Yep. So we're constantly looking at pricing, how much do things cost? And how we much don't do mark cost? anything up. And we don't mark, oh. so like, so for property management, that's, that's, I can tell you, that's one thing we do not do is so when we get, like someone gets an HVAC bill for $500, right? Mm. Something happened with their air conditioning. You're going to see a receipt on your owner page for a $500 charge from that vendor. And we remitted payment from your escrow account to mm. that vendor for $500, not that's $580. Right. A lot so of like we're not taking a cut of that. companies will, will have an upcharge on yeah. everything of like, 15 percent yeah holy cow yeah that could be a lot for bigger that could be a lot so yeah. like watching costs is is important but but our vendor relationships are really important to us so they make our business run right we rely very heavily on vendors um oh. and we have some good ones so yeah. how, but how did you do that like how did you like oh I'll i want to paint it on, like, early on um when we were just establishing the property management business, a lot of our new business came from that um, perspective where other property management companies, they don't care what the invoice comes in at. Mm -hmm. So they were getting aggravated because replacing a toilet flapper was costing $150. It does. That's what it costs now, if well, not more. But my 12-year-old can do it for $12. That's right. I taught my my son <laughs> to change out toilet flappers. Like, you're going to learn I how says, to do this. Dude, this is a valuable lesson. <laughs> yeah, do that in lawns and you're good to go <laughs> yes. in this area. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you can but, charge someone 150 for that. Honestly, I've always been a people person um, uh, in terms of relational. I One thing that I don't always enjoy about real estate and I try to do um, my best to, to, um, do, to be better about this is not just communicating via phone and email all the time. I love to have the face to face. Mm -hmm. So same thing with vendors, you know, I could call somebody up, but a lot of times I'm on the job site with them. Mm. Maybe I'm assisting them. Maybe I'm checking on them. Right. But, um, you know, I, I would say, I, I thought about this earlier, like, um, you know, a lot of times you learn a business by working from the ground up. You started here and you worked your way up. And I would say that's true of me uh, to a certain extent in real estate. It kind of happened, you know, just naturally with my dad having property and, you know, being thrust into the world of being a landlord in college and everything like that. But I've always been a very hands-on kind of person. Right. So I can fix a toilet. I can, you know, hang a light fixture or, or whatever. Right. I mean, I'm probably not quite as handy now as I once was, but... Yep. Um, you Toby, know, I could Toby do Keith. some of those Sorry. things. That's right. <laughs> but, um, you know, just having the personal relationship with them. And a lot of our vendors have been vendors of ours for many, many years. Wow. Um, you know, and uh, we value the relationship. It's not all yeah. about the money mm -hmm. um, or trying to undercut them. And again, this is something that I've learned over the years. I used to always try to cut their prices so mm -hmm. that we could like, oh my gosh, that's too expensive. And, you know, I, I had to learn some hard lessons that way where it's like, you know what? They're a business too. Right. Yeah. They've got overhead. They've got expenses. And maybe the value of their work is more than I actually think it is. Mm. Um, and so, you know, instead of arguing, you know, obviously I know if something is way out of hand. Right. right. But if I think it should be here and it's, you know, a few hundred dollars more than that, I've just kind of learned to let that go at this mm -hmm. point. Um, you know, we are having to try to watch the, the bottom line for our owners, you know, right. and make sure they're not getting gouged by vendors. Right. But at the end of the day... Um, you know, just having that relationship. And sometimes we'll call a vendor up and we're like, dude, we're in a hard place here. This owner literally has no money. Can you come over and, and, you know, do something for not for nothing, right. but you know, you build those relationships, you establish those things and they're going to help you out. Cause they know there's other business to come that's right. from that. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. That's huge. I like, I, I wanted to make sure I hit that before, mm -hmm. cause I think that's such an important thing it that, is. that I think really prime good Real realtors and brokerage <laughs> should have so. Yep. Um. <clears throat> okay. We're getting closer to the end. Is there any other things that y'all would like to discuss 
from the realtor brokerage standpoint before we get into, I'm going to ask a, what is a one personal and professional life lesson? You give me like a, a, a big, I'm talking more little more nuance that you'll sort of live day to day by. And then of course we'll get into the, the special question, but anything else that you want to wrap up the realtor brokerage portion and or property management standpoint. <laughs> Quiet. I guess that's a no. Wow. wow. Never thought that would happen. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay. Oh, actually I, I have something that I could say. Yes. Just give us time. This goes we'll back to my up. top five that Andrew was contributing to. So I didn't oh. finish. Um, <laughs> So, um, we knew it was going to happen. We get a lot of calls. I yeah, look, we, I will say this from a business, like use this as a resource. Like I love getting a call from someone who says, who may not ever use us. I, I took, a, I took this call this week. Okay. And it was someone who bought a home, had to move. Um, they're going to, they're going to be underwater, whether they rent or whether they sell. And we just had a long conversation. What options do you have? What does this look like for you? Mm -hmm. And is it renting? And this is what it looks like on paper. This is the financial you know, this is a financial analysis of this. And then let's talk about the sales side. This is a financial analysis of this. And you give them decisions to make, right? Mm -hmm. You can't make that decision for someone, but you can lay it out on paper so that they can make a really good informed decision. Don't yeah. be afraid to call us and say, I'm, I'm trying to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. And and we love to be resourced to people. Um, and we'll, I'm, a, I will tend to, and Andrew as well. And, and there are people on our staff that can do this, that can take a call about about property management and do an analysis for a rental, even if they're not using us to sell our home, mm -hmm. they're going to use somebody else. We can give that, that perspective and I'll say, are do you, and I will always ask, do you have a real estate agent that you, that you're loyal to that you're working with? And mm -hmm. if you do go have them perform a sales analysis for you, and I'm going to give you the property management analysis. And then you're just, you get to make that financial choice that you, or sometimes it's not a financial choice. It mm -hmm. really is. You know, housing is sometimes it's an emotional choice mm -hmm. um, or they're, there are other reasons why people make a choice to sell versus versus lease or lease versus sell. Um, but we're gonna, our job is to give you the financial picture. Right. That. And what is the best financial choice for you? Use this as a re resource and we love that. Even if mm -hmm. you're never a client, like we're happy to be a resource for someone. That's awesome. I'm going to piggyback on that. That was great. Um, yeah, I, that's something that I've learned from Tiff um, over the years is, you know, in business, a lot of times I, I do um, masterminds with other real estate experts and, and things like that. And, you know, we're always trying to learn and, and things like this. And, and some of the things that you'll hear when you're talking business is, you know, you want to do the dollar producing activities. So sometimes what we do can be boiled down to where am I going to make the most money? And the reality is that is not who we are and that's not what we try to do in everything that we do. So Yes. Can I get frustrated that maybe I spent months with somebody and I will never see a dime from it mm -hmm. that I'm aware of? And that's the beauty of real estate. I had a client recently. They're moving. They're a military family. Um, they're coming here um, uh, on military orders and they're only going to be here for two years. Mm -hmm. I showed them a lot of homes to purchase. Mm -hmm. That's what I specialize in. But mm -hmm. I also told them, I says, look, we have a property management division. Um, I sent them a link to all of our active rentals and they told me up front, full disclosure, Hey, we might not buy, we might rent. Mm -hmm. And I says, you know what? It doesn't matter to me because my perspective is this, everything will work out in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that when I treat you right, you're going to refer me to your family and friends. And mm -hmm. so I said, you know, and ultimately they did decide to rent not from, not a property that we even manage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, did I spend several months um, or weeks, four to six weeks probably, looking at homes here and there, many hours doing this, a mm -hmm. lot of time on the phone with them? Yes. Was I happy to do that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I would, and this is what I would say that I've kind of transitioned in my career. Um, I would love to be that resource for people because I can. Mm -hmm. I can be. I've done well in my career. Mm -hmm. I don't have to sell a home to you in order to put food on my table. Mm -hmm. I want to, mm -hmm. but I don't have to. Um, and we would much rather be a resource for people because at some point, you know what, those people may retire and they may move back here. Yeah. Those people have colleagues, you know, whatever. Sure. I mean, ultimately what goes around comes around. And I firmly believe in that. Um, you treat people right and uh, the rest will work itself out. Mm, that's fantastic. So 
I think that, man, that may, maybe I'm going to start with you, Tiffany, because that may have answered the question. So okay. is there something like on a day-to-day -day basis, a mantra, whatever, that you live from, from a personal and or professional side of the house? Something that you learned bef like a long time ago, more recently, something that sort of helped is your guiding light, like something like that. Do you have anything? Yeah, I, I can think of two things. Actually, one is you're always learning. Um, I tell my kids like practice doesn't make perfect, right? Practice makes progress. Mm. So we're still progressing. I, I really think that as a business, we're, we're continuing to move up. We're continuing to grow. We have a long way to go. Um, and it's exciting to think about the future. Um, so just under, just the understanding that we're always, we're always learning. The market is always shifting. It's never, it's never stagnant. There's always some change. I, I love change. I think it clears the room a little bit mm. and, um, it, makes you dig in and, and learn something. So we're always learning new things, right? And two, I think one of the questions that you sent us is sort of an outline um, for doing the podcast was what's the what's the most important conversation you've ever had? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? So mm -hmm. I'm gonna, can I answer that? Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, I think that was, that's a conversation that's ongoing. Um, you might've caught from us, like our our faith is a big part of our lives. And so I, for, for me, the biggest conversation is is through prayer and every day like just that is the most important conversation that i'm having on a regular basis am mm. i right here mm. right and so am i am i doing what i'm called to do with my life um with my day with my time with my family with our business and that's the most important conversation i'm having and then two and andrew and i've talked about this the second most important conversation that we're having is with our community right mm. the people that are sharpening us that are telling us when we're wrong that are encouraging us um, personally and in our business. Those are important conversations to have. And I think even like as we're raising our children, and you probably see this with your own kids, it's important who we're, our kids are surrounded by. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I got some good advice recently from someone who said, you know, your kids need five adults in their lives that they are, um, that are feeding into them and being a good example. And they're looking up to you that it, that it, that it's not you. Mm -hmm. Right. So surrounding good adults and good peers you know, to your children is important as well. And so it's important for us. I think it's important for all humans to be surrounded by people that are encouraging them, that are, um, that are providing us with advice, that are sharpening us, that are telling us when we're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, our community is really important too. Love that. Yeah. We, we kind of uh, talked about that together. And um, I would just say that, um, you know, again, I'm, I feel like I, th I like in my career to uh, um, a lot of the military people that we work with because I'm pa I'm at my 20 plus year mark in the industry. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I should be retiring now. I mean, all my friends that are in the military are like, <laughs> they're at retirement age. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I feel like I'm just getting started, you know, but on the, on the one hand, on the other hand, I'm yep. like, dad gummit, it's been 20 years. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, so I'm a workaholic. Yep. Um, Me too. Uh, and... Yeah. Um, I mean, we work hard. We've talked about that, but it's important um, to have outlets. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I've learned. So we serve in our church. Um, I'm a deacon at our church, which which basically um, my role as a deacon in our church is mostly facilities management, um, which ties in great with, with what I do every day. You know, I'm kind of keeping an eye on the gutters that are falling off the building or mm. actually my specific area is the landscaping. So, um, you know, I kind of oversee that and, and make sure that the grounds, um, you know, good curb appeal. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> hey, look, it's not a business, but you yeah. know, I mean, you don't want to be falling apart when people are pulling into your driveway and, sure. and things like that. But um um, so that's a way that I serve, but we lead uh, a life group in our church. Um, um, and what our group um, is right now is basically a welcoming to new families. Our church, um, like a lot of, you know, uh, people have experienced around here has just exploded mm. um, in terms of numbers. And so we have a lot of new families coming mm. and, and, you know, people are looking for community. Right. Um, and so we've welcomed them in and, and um, you know, once a month we have a, a a meal at the church after the service. And, and it's just a great time to kind of dig in and, and get to know people a little bit more intimately. Right. Um, but I have a group, um, on Friday mornings, I actually didn't go today. Um, um, but we work out, um, and, um, then we spend the second half of our hour typically, and, and we're praying for one another. Mm. Um, you know, I meet with a colleague on Thursday mornings, we swim and we run, and then we pray for one another. Mm. 
And ultimately, you know, um, we don't want to sound super spiritual or anything mm. here, but the reality is, um, you know, our church and our faith is a big part of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. And I'm mindful of the example that we're setting, not only to our, to our kids, you mm -hmm. know, who are watching us, but to people that we interact with. And I'm, you know, I'll say I'm not, I, I don't do that perfectly. I fail mm -hmm. regularly, but one of the, the conversations, you know, the question was what, conversations have you had mm -hmm. it's that conversation in prayer and that's to mm -hmm. our to our savior mm -hmm. to, with jesus mm -hmm. um and you know so i'll get up often early in the morning and i'll just be you know in the word i'll be in the bible just reading um you know and and trying to impart that um to my kids you know to be a great example to them and and to our employees to be you know the examples that that uh that we desire for them and and um you know, um, community, yeah. I would say is just kind of the, the summary of all that. No, that's great. I appreciate that. That's, that's a huge part. I, I, yeah, I think that's huge. You know, it's, it's funny. Even, uh, I remember Jim talking about the difference, the differentiator between like bigger coffee chains and like theirs was community. Like that's a huge tie in. They're like, you know, how, how do you differentiate? Well, we become more and more involved with the community. Like mm -hmm. they'll go set up at a swim meet, right? Yeah. Getting coffee there. That's, different than the big chains. And mm -hmm. so like, there's a lot of that. So no, I appreciate y'all saying that. That's a huge, th those are, I don't want to call them soft touch points, but you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. the hard sell, but then there's the soft touch points. And, and that, that brings a lot and, and tells also a lot about y'all and your, your family. So thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. Are you guys ready? Special question time. <laughs> okay. I've changed it up a little bit. Okay. So let me think, mm, I'm going to go with Tiffany first, if that's okay. Okay. okay Tiffany. You probably have heard this around. You probably, you know, answered it before. But if you could have any superhero power, what would it be? <gasps> My kids asked me this yesterday. You're welcome. Super <laughs> intelligence. Super intelligence. Yes. And you have to tell me why. Okay. Well, I'll tell you the context. My kids made me do that Harry Potter quiz. Like, which house would you belong to? I love that. Um, and the question was, would you rather fly? Would you rather be super smart? Or would you rather... I can't remember what the others were, but I, I said super smart. I don't know. I think there's something... I'm a reader. Um, I love to learn new things and just get new... I love history. Mm. Um, so I just think it would be really cool to be a walking encyclopedia wow. and, and just know things. I mean, flying sounds fun, yeah, fun, but <laughs> not really practical. So I, I think I would just, I would rather be really smart. Do you know, um, there's a lady named Dr. Carol DeWick. Have you heard of her? No. So she wrote a book called mindsets okay. and it's the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Mm. So you're very much a growth mindset. Okay. Yes. Ooh, I like you know. it. I'm going to have to read that. It's add that to my list. Read Elon's first. Elon's okay. First. I will. <laughs> I, will I, I love will feeling you put forward. a link for those in the bio. I, I'll do my best. I used <laughs> to have like a no joke running when I used to do the professional development things and I had a running list because mm -hmm. I would like just pull them out of the air to, to reference during my. Well, and I think like identifying, okay, if you could have a superhero strength. Okay. I'm thinking when I engage with other people, I am most interested in people who know things that I don't know. Oh yeah. Right. So who are so, that's so Great. interesting to me about, I know nothing about that topic, right? That's why, that's so, why like, that was the genesis of people at value experiences. Yeah. I have these conversations and I'm learning so much. I'm like, I really want to share this. Like I've I learned so much. I bet other people could learn a lot from this. Like that's literally, I keep repeating that. Cause like, that is the genesis of this is like, mm -hmm. this is not for me. Well, it is for me cause I'm learning, but it's also like to share this out to other people to be like, yeah. Hey, now you get to learn some cool tidbits or nuggets that right. maybe you read, but now you're getting the down. There are other person. people like you that also want to learn things 100%. from other people. hundred yes. percent. Okay, Andrew. So this one's a little bit different, right? Um, and I've asked this before because there's some reasoning behind it. But if you had you had one day, right? Let's say there's an alloc allocated amount of time, and you had an, an infinite amount of money to spend, but just for <laughs> one day in this infinite amount, infinite amount of time, what brick and mortar store would you go to? Man, wow. I don't spend a lot of money on myself. Oh, um, I can answer this for you. Um, <laughs> really? This is why we, we, you know, it's our better half. We're, I still wear some things from college. Date, you know what I'm saying? On our first date, oh, where there, did yeah, we this stop is not at? Untrue. And every date ever since. Go ahead. I'm Amber. a Lowe's kind of guy yeah. now. Um, <laughs> you know, the Lowe's pro. Um, yeah, she's right. She's not wrong. Um, 
I've I've um, gotten this blower fetish, um, the battery powered ones, because all my gas powered things are like falling apart oh, these no. days. That you you know this is why the government wants you to go away from gas and go, <laughs> get everything battery. You know, um, I got an awesome. Uh, it's for my son's lawn business. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I'm making him pay for half of it, but, um, uh, you know, uh, investing in the lawn equipment, I got the ego, the ego gas powered blower. It's freaking awesome. Mm. Um, uh, I had bought a Dewalt one. I, can we name drop? I- I don't see why not. I'm not I mean, that. I wasn't. Not. <laughs> I wasn't impressed with the battery life on the battery yeah. powered Dewalt blower, so yeah. I returned it and getting. I got the Ego. It's awesome. So you said the Ego is gas or battery? It's battery. Oh, you said okay. So fifty six volts. <laughs> um, it's got a massive battery. I blew off the entire parking lot in our office yesterday, and I went by Parker Wanda. Wanda coffee like three times. He goes, did you get a new toy? <laughs> and um, I'm like, yes, I'm testing it out because, you know, Live Oak is laying all these fibers yes. and messing up my sidewalk. Right. So I try to blow it off for the, for the, you know, for the businesses yes. in the front because we yeah. only have the lawn come once a week and the right. leaves are falling and yeah. blow it I love down. that it's an excuse. Yeah. Like, that's what it's like. Oh, I got this new drill. Well, we've had these boards laying around for a while, so I probably need to drill some holes in them. Like, yeah. that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Our, going back to that, our first date, well, here. So we were going, long story. But, and she said, hey, I'm, we're going to bring the truck because I got to pick up some doors and put them in the back of the truck. So on our way to like have a date, we were... Seaside. Yeah. We were like loading up. We were opening... We were loading up a truckload of doors Bill in the materials. back. I said, yeah. look, at least I was honest up front. Right. You know, yeah. I wasn't hiding anything. This is my right. life. You, you mm-hmm. thought like, this is not going good. Why is he getting plastic wrap, chainsaws, bone saws? Yeah. Like, it's not, this is not a good idea. This is not a good idea. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So the reason I asked that question is because I've heard a myriad of different answers from like a watch store to people try to say Amazon. That's why I'm very strict about brick and mortar. Yep. Um, but it's mm. interesting because some people go, I, it, wait, I would go to Lowe's because I could build my own house. Uh, right. Oh. So it's this interesting like mindset of like how would you do that or like you said some people are like i would go buy out like a um a Publix and then give that to a charitable like oh, food organization yeah. so it's, it's an interesting like question mm-hmm. that you could have the potential to to peel back a little yeah. bit more to find out like you know because is it more materialistic is it more giving is it like more like you know what mm-hmm. is it is it something they're currently into like oh i'd love to go buy a brand new car at ferrari right like you know uh-huh. like what is that and so so those are the that's that's the reasoning sort of behind the question yeah. is it gets a little bit know a little bit more about yeah. the person i think so. you got to know like i think both of us like like to work with our hands yeah so i was kind of joking the other day the reason i'm the only person i know not in therapy is because i rake my own leaves you know <laughs> yeah there's something <laughs> about get that outside. that is therapeutic get outside and do yes. something until yeah. you throw your back so well, sure that true. that happened we did that, mm-hmm. we did that. south wind i threw my back thank you yeah. dr latham yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um well everyone i think we've hit everything and more that we wanted to cover today on people I value experience from the realtor and brokerage perspective and getting to know more about Andrew and Tiffany at Sound Choice. Real estate. Real estate. Thank you. Did I say reality earlier? Because I probably tried to check that up. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I know time is money. I appreciate it. I, I won't even try to know how much you make an hour and how much this cost me. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so I really, really appreciate you guys We're coming on. back. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, this, yes, is the, yes. this is the charitable donation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind it. I won't. I won't we, we really enjoyed this. Yeah, man. this is I mean, good. Honestly, is good. Uh, when we have opportunities to do stuff like this, we kind of... Um, probably shy away from it, which might be why it took us how long to, to get on this a year. I don't know, but, um, We're af- after we do it, um, uh, we always enjoy it and, um, uh, appreciate what you're doing here. And, yeah. and, uh, we enjoy listening to the podcast, uh, when they come out and, uh, the people you've had on here, you know, getting those nuggets. Yep. That's right. Um, All about the nuggets. Know, yeah. So thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Uh, thank y'all. Well, until next time, take care.